Reading about hypnosis and actually performing it are two very different things. As I was learning to hypnotize people, I was unable to obtain a very important piece of material, an actual induction script that worked. Now this is one of the main reasons that I decided to write this book, so that I could put you on the right track right from the beginning. The purpose of this guide is to allow a reader, or in this case a listener, with no former knowledge of hypnosis whatsoever, the ability to induce trance in a person, know what to do with that trance, and then safely bring them back to fully waking consciousness afterwards. Now this I feel I have accomplished, and with a little bit of practice, it is very probable that you will soon follow the same path that I have taken, and be performing your own hypnotic stay shows to the paying public. Back in 1992, while casually browsing through a book by Arthur C. Clarke, I stumbled upon an illustration of a man levitating a good two foot clean of the floor. Now one of the possible explanations as to how this man had accomplished such a seemingly impossible feat was that he had hypnotised the witnesses so that they were unable to see a chair that he was standing on. Now when I read that I just thought wow, the ability to make a person not see something which is so obviously there, now this was far too tempting to ignore. I became increasingly fascinated with the possibilities of hypnosis. I decided that I wanted to be able to hypnotise people, and I began my research. Over the following weeks, months, and of course years, I became a hypnotic junkie. So what is hypnosis, and why does it work? Well, before I tell you about what hypnosis is, I must first tell you what it is not. One of the most common misconceptions about hypnosis is that it is sleep. Although a hypnotised person does appear to take on the characteristics of somebody sleeping, they are actually quite alert. Now hypnosis is very difficult to describe, as nobody actually knows for certain what is going on inside the mind of a hypnotised subject. What we do know is that while in a trance state, the subject becomes increasingly open to suggestion. As a person begins to enter trance, their attention gradually shifts inwards. Now this begins with the sense of sight, as they are instructed to close their eyes. After a little while, it is not uncommon for someone to lose complete awareness of their body, and one by one the physical senses begin to slowly slip away. There is, however, one sense, the sense of hearing, that does not confine itself internally. A hypnotised subject can often hear distant sounds that they would not be able to hear in the normal waking state. This also of course means that throughout the entire process the subject is able to hear absolutely everything that the hypnotist might say. Now when you begin hypnotising people, you will often find that upon waking them from the trance state, they may believe that they couldn't have been hypnotised because they could still hear your voice. As already stated, a person in hypnosis becomes increasingly suggestible. One of the reasons for this is that while in trance, you are only able to concentrate on one thing at a time. For example, if I were to tell you that you're a dainty ballerina, you would immediately compare this suggestion with what you already know to be true. And unless, of course, you are a dainty ballerina, you would tell me that I'm talking nonsense. Now, a hypnotised subject is not able to entertain the thought that they are not what I've suggested, as their limited concentration is taken up by the suggestion itself. To better understand the hypnotic process, it helps to imagine that the human mind is split in two. These two sections are known as the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, which is also often called the unconscious. Now, the conscious mind is responsible for all of our conscious thoughts and decisions. The subconscious mind regulates autonomous activity, such as knowing how much pressure to apply to your grip in order to pick up a delicate object without breaking it, or to make sure you carry on breathing while you sleep. Now you may like to think of the mind as a computer. The conscious mind is the input peripherals, the mouse and the keyboard, whereas the subconscious mind, that's the brains of the computer, the processor and the memory chips. Somewhere between these two minds, or parts of one mind, is a door. Now, the subconscious mind will process any suggestion that can pass through that door, no matter how bizarre that suggestion might be. So, as long as we can get a suggestion through the door, it will be obeyed. Now, there are limitations to what can be accepted at a subconscious level, but we'll just cover these later. During normal waking consciousness, there's a kind of guard on duty that continually watches over this door. Now, this guard is known as the critical factor. The purpose of the guard is to protect the subconscious mind. The guard compares any suggestion that tries to pass through the door with those that are already on the other side. 
If a suggestion conflicts with one that's already been accepted, then it's simply rejected. Now, conflicting suggestions, they just rock the boat. They disrupt the status quo. And as far as the critical factor is concerned, this is bad news. The critical factor wants every tomorrow to be the same as every yesterday. You see, what we did yesterday obviously worked because we're still here today. And the goal of the critical factor is to make sure that we carry on being here tomorrow. So the critical factor doesn't like change. Now, sometimes, obviously, we desire change. We often want to stop doing things that we know we shouldn't do. And we also want to start doing new things that we believe will help us accomplish a goal. Of course, as a stage hypnotist, we often make suggestions that we know will conflict with those already accepted, such as the ballerina example that we've already given. The purpose of hypnosis is to get suggestions that would normally be rejected past this guard without the guard noticing. However, hypnosis is not the only way to do this. There are situations that cause the door to the subconscious mind to swing open and the guard can do nothing to protect us from incoming suggestions. An overload of stress on the conscious mind can cause it to completely close down and this causes the subconscious mind to take over. The door just swings open and before you know it, a ridiculous suggestion is willingly accepted, sorted and planted deep in the subconscious mind. The suggestion becomes a belief, which creates a new map of reality. On occasion, this manifests itself as an irrational phobia. Unfortunately, once the suggestion has been accepted, the guard immediately starts to protect it. So conflicting suggestions are rejected, and we are stuck with a problem which, on a conscious level, may seem ridiculous. Now, sometimes, when we're very, very relaxed, the guard nods off and a suggestion can sneak past and gain access to our subconscious mind. We're actually going to be taking advantage of this later when we learn the progressive relaxation hypnotic induction. It's also possible to confuse the guard and slip a suggestion into the subconscious mind before it realizes what's happened. This, as you'll soon discover, enables you to hypnotize people very, very quickly. Now, in order to allow us to create a foundation of beliefs upon which we'll base our reality, this door to the subconscious mind, the critical factor, it generally remains open for the first seven or eight years of our lives. Of course, during that time, we absorb lots of suggestions from our parents that are based on their belief system. And as their belief systems have been created by their reality, we then adopt them as we create ours. So have you ever noticed how you seem to be gradually becoming more and more like your parents as you age? Another way that thoughts gain access to the subconscious mind is simply through repetition. Advertising agencies know this and spend millions of pounds creating catchy jingles that are designed to get their advertising slogan accepted by our subconscious. My first hypnotic experience. After reading a great deal on hypnosis, I gradually became more and more confident that I would have the ability to induce trance in a subject. Now, the first induction that I attempted was also my first success, and this gave me a huge confidence boost. Although the first induction was successful, many of the ones that followed were not. I regularly practiced my newfound skill on friends. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. At the time, it was a little disheartening when the subject didn't go under, but I soon began to realize that different people respond to different inductions. As my skills developed, I was able to adjust my inductions and hypnotize more people more often. Around the same time, I was also discovering new and more powerful language patterns that I was able to incorporate into my scripts, which made them much, much more effective. Now, my very, very first induction took place on the 21st of February, 1992, in a small hotel room in Chamonix in the French Alps. I was sat in my hotel room with my sister and a few of her close friends. Now, I didn't really know any of her friends and I was a really shy teenager, so I was pretty much keeping myself to myself. I'd hidden myself away from the others and I was lost in my own little world reading books on hypnosis. Now, a guy called Mark, who was a friend of my sister's, noticed what I was reading and he asked if I could hypnotize him. Now, I've got to tell you, I was terrified. Up to this point, I'd never actually tried using hypnosis. I just enjoyed studying it. 
everything I'd learned back then was complete theory. I was incredibly shy, and if anybody ever challenged me to hypnotise them, I'd just run a mile. I'd make some feeble excuse about somewhere else I had to be, and then I'd avoid that person for the next few days, hoping they'd forget all about it. You see, I didn't really actually believe in hypnosis back then, and I certainly didn't think I'd ever be able to do it. But this time was different. This time I couldn't run, I was trapped in a pokey hotel room, and Mark knew there was nowhere I needed to be. So I guess I could have said no. I could have told Mark I'd never done it before, and I'd only ever really read about it. I could have told him that I didn't even really believe it was real, that I thought it was all acting or that it required some kind of psychic power that I just didn't have, because that really is what I thought at the time. But I didn't do this. A voice inside my head told me that I had to do it. It was time to put everything I'd been studying into action. In theory, even though I didn't really believe in hypnosis yet, Based on everything I'd read so far, the basic induction that I'd pieced together should work. So, very, very nervous and anxious and a little excited, I told Mark to relax and close his eyes. I went through a very, very basic progressive relaxation induction. I made mistakes, I fumbled my words, and I lost my place more times than I care to admit when I counted him backwards into trance. Fortunately for me, Mark was an incredible subject. He readily began to display obvious signs of trance, so I began giving him suggestions, which he followed. At this point, I refused to accept it was real. I was convinced that Mark was acting. Remember, back then, I still didn't even really believe in hypnosis, so I was having a really hard time accepting the possibility that I was actually doing it. What happened next changed everything. By pure luck, I gave Mark the suggestion that he begin to feel colder and colder. Now within moments of my suggestion, all the tiny hairs on his arms all stood on end and he got goosebumps. Now I was stunned. That very moment I realised that there was no way he could be acting. People just can't fake goosebumps. But I was still doubting that this could be real, and I convinced myself that he must have felt a draft that I hadn't noticed. I mean, we were in the French Alps. So I immediately changed my suggestion, and I told him that it was beginning to get hotter and hotter. At that very moment, the goosebumps vanished. All the tiny hairs lay back down, his face reddened, and he actually began to sweat. This is the moment that I became a complete believer in hypnosis. It totally changed my life. Now, I've got to admit to you, my induction was terrible. I was incredibly lucky that Mark was so responsive, and if I'd done the same induction on any of the other people present, I really don't think they'd have gone into hypnosis. The dangers of hypnosis. Now, hypnosis is a very powerful tool, and it must be used with the utmost caution and treated with the utmost respect. A hypnotist is able to make a subject do almost anything if it's put across in the correct manner. Now it is a common belief that the hypnotized subject will not do anything against their will. Now even if this were true, it would probably not prevent an unscrupulous hypnotist manipulating a subject to do something they wouldn't usually do because people have very weak wills. Now, I'm not going to focus on how hypnosis can be abused because I don't think that such a focus is appropriate for a book teaching you how to do it. But I will say that hypnosis is a tool. Hypnosis is neither good nor bad, it just is. A scalpel can save your life or it can end it, depending on who is wielding the scalpel. Hypnosis can make your life much better or much worse, depending on who is applying the hypnosis. Think about it. Earlier, we explored the possibility of a suggestion accidentally gaining access to your subconscious mind and manifesting itself as a phobia. Now, if this can happen by accident, you bet that it can happen deliberately if that's what a hypnotist is trying to achieve. Of course, you'd have to go to a pretty evil hypnotist to walk away with a phobia that you never had to begin with. My suggestion is that you only entertain the idea of using hypnotists that come highly recommended. If you're worried about what they might suggest, take a friend with you or have the entire session recorded. As you practice hypnosis, you need to be aware of an entirely different danger. The kind that doesn't require an evil hypnotist, but you can do all by yourself without even realizing. In fact, you might have the very best intentions at heart, but a lack of experience could cause you to do a lot more harm than good. What I'm referring to here is the use of hypnosis to remove pain. As your skills develop, 
you'll very quickly discover that hypnosis is a fantastic way of controlling pain. In fact, during the war, several operations were conducted in the field without anaesthetic. The only pain relief available to the soldiers was hypnosis, and it works. Now, the danger lies in the removal of pain without correct diagnosis. Pain is just a warning signal that something is not right. If you remove the warning without addressing the cause, you could be setting yourself up for a very, very big fall. Sometimes, of course, a headache is just a headache. Sometimes it's a warning of something much more serious. Now, if you go and remove a headache with hypnosis, and it turns out that this particular headache was the warning sign of a brain tumor, you could inadvertently cause a person to miss the opportunity to seek professional diagnosis and medical treatment. Now, obviously, the consequences of this could be life-threatening. Now, if you want to make sure that you are never a danger to others, never treat pain that has not been properly diagnosed by a professional. Unless you're qualified to do so, never try to diagnose a physical symptom yourself, no matter how obvious it may appear. Now, most trans subjects, the level of reality that is created by suggestion would not usually cause a problem, but in some, a suggestion becomes very, very real indeed, so you must exercise caution when giving your suggestions. For example, if you told a person that your finger was a red hot poker and then you touched them with it, they would feel pain. Some subjects would respond exactly as though you have used a real red hot poker. They would have a physiological response to the experience, in other words, a hell of a lot of pain and a nasty blister. Now remember, Mark, the very first person I ever hypnotized, had a physiological response to my suggestion. He got goosebumps when I told him it was cold, and he began to sweat when I told him it was hot. If I'd told him that I got a red hot poker and I'd have touched his skin, he would have had a physiological response. His skin would have blistered, and he would have experienced a tremendous amount of pain. Now, you may recall a documentary on Channel 4 in the UK back in around 2003 called The Dark Side of Hypnosis. The documentary explored the possible dangers of hypnosis, particularly relating to stage performance. One incident, discussed at length during the show, is certainly worth mentioning here. Perhaps one of the most notorious hypnotists of today, called Alex Smith, was also known as Alex Leroy and Jonathan Royal. He gave the suggestion that one of his subjects on a stage show would feel 10,000 volts of electricity surging through her chair as she woke from trance. Now, unfortunately, and we can say there's no correlation between these two incidents, but a few days later, she was found dead in her bed by her mother. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that Alex was responsible for her death. No one can say that. If they could, I'm sure Alex would currently be serving a rather long jail sentence and not enjoying a very successful career as a complete mind therapist here in the stars. Incidentally, complete mind therapy, or CMT, is Alex's own creation, and it combines an assortment of therapeutic techniques that are all designed to elicit positive change, and it really, really does work. Again, Alex also hit the headlines when he performed in his hometown. Now, he'd played this venue before, so he wanted to really spice things up a little bit. And he decided, rather foolishly, to suggest to a female volunteer that she would imagine that he'd just raped her. Now, this is really not a very good suggestion. The offence of this particular suggestion was exacerbated by the fact that it followed a fall in love with the sexy hypnotist routine at the point where Alex had just given his volunteer the command to sleep while midway through writhing down his body. So as she plunged back into trance, her head lolled forward very suggestively and came to a rest in his crotch. Now, I personally don't think that Alex had intended to give that rape suggestion, but it just popped into his head and it came out of his mouth because of the unusual situation he found himself in. In his defence, Alex insisted that the use of the word imagine made it okay to give someone that kind of suggestion. Now, I totally disagree. If you're going to give someone a suggestion and it's going to cause offence to the people that are watching the performance or offence to the subject that's actually volunteered for you, then you really shouldn't go there. Although I do have to admit that my own hypnotic adventures are not wholly unblemished. I really would have to go a long way to match Alex Leroy, but in the early days of messing around with hypnosis, with my staff at McDonald's, which was my first job out of school, I made a few very silly suggestions that I later regretted. Nothing too serious. One particular incident that comes to mind was the day I stuck a staff member's feet to the floor, only allowing him to take single steps before coming stuck again on each click of my fingers. A really simple suggestion, but to spice things up a little bit, which is always a mistake, 
I gave the poor crew member the suggestion that if anyone who was present in the room should say the word diarrhea, he would instantly be overwhelmed with a phenomenal bout of diarrhea and desperately need the loo. Now, I'm sure you can imagine what happened next. Of course, at this point, everyone in the room said diarrhea a lot. We all laughed at the poor unfortunate's obvious discomfort as he clenched his buttocks, desperately trying to unstick his feet. I slowly and rather cruelly clicked my fingers, allowing him to gradually inch teasingly closer to the much needed toilet. I'd already installed the suggestion that if I clapped my hands, both feet would be instantly released, and we all fell about laughing at his expense when I clapped my hands and released him to run off to his toilet. Now, this happened at about three o'clock in the morning. We'd finished closing down the store, we'd all finished tidying up, and the poor lad emerged from the toilet. I removed the remaining suggestions, and we all headed off home. The next day, the store manager, who at the time was of course my boss, called me at the ridiculous hour of 6am when he turned up at the store. He was in a very bad mood. It seemed that unbeknownst to me, sometime during my shift the previous night, someone had crapped all over the staff changing room's floor. Well, I guess my poor victim never really made it to the toilet after all. Now, I just gotta say, if you are listening to this by any chance, Craig, I am very, very sorry for that suggestion. In the early days, we did fall around with hypnosis a little bit too much. Now, they were other foolish suggestions too, but I was young. I still wasn't truly sure that I believed in hypnosis. I kind of thought that Craig was acting a few times when we used to do this at McDonald's. And uh, I grappled with that for many years, but very fortunately, I developed a tremendous respect for hypnosis and through an understanding of the consequences of careless suggestions before I took my first steps into the spotlight, my ego-fueled idiotic suggestions never ever came under scrutiny. For Alex Leroy, or Jonathan Royal as he's now known, he wasn't so fortunate, but I think he's learning rather slowly, but he's definitely becoming more responsible. Now the reason I mention all this is because I want you to realise that you, and absolutely nobody else but you, will have to answer for your actions. If you're going to do something as stupid as give someone the suggestion that they'll feel 10,000 volts of electricity surging through their chair, or imagine that you've just raped them, then you better prepare yourself for a great deal of very, very negative attention. If you were considering the rape suggestion in the first place, even a tiny little bit, then just turn off this recording or stop reading the book immediately because hypnosis is definitely not for you and if you carry on pursuing this kind of subject you will most certainly wind up in prison. Of course I'm kind of hoping that you wouldn't be so foolish. I think that most people that are attracted to hypnosis are fascinated by the subject for all of the right reasons. Hypnotists are generally very very spiritual people. Every now and then we get the odd bad apple with the inflated ego and something to prove but these are very few and far between. So, my advice to you is to only ever give a suggestion that would be safe if it was completely real. Now this rules out the possibility of electrocuting someone and also only give suggestions that your volunteer and your audience are not going to find offensive. Your job as a stage hypnotist is nothing whatsoever to do with your ego. Your job as a stage hypnotist is to entertain your audience and increase the public's awareness of hypnotic phenomena. Ideally, your stage performance should leave people wanting to find out more about hypnosis. And if you decide to expand your skills and study hypnotherapy, it should leave people wanting to buy your products. So, if you would like to find out more about the darker side of hypnosis, then I really recommend that you grab yourself a copy of a book called Mind Control Hypnosis by Dantalian Jones. I think it was published in 2009. It's a fascinating read. It's subtitled What All the Other Hypnotists Don't Want You to Know About Hypnosis. So, as I'm pretty sure you can imagine, it does get pretty juicy. Suggestibility Tests a suggestibility test is exactly what you would expect it to be. A simple test that shows how suggestible your hypnotic subject is. Now everybody who is of sound mind can be hypnotized, but not everybody will go into trance at the speeds that are often necessary for the entertainment value of a stage show. And this is where the suggestibility test comes to the rescue. Now a test can be performed on the entire audience, or if you prefer, you can invite the willing volunteers up onto the stage first and then use the test to determine which subjects you're going to keep for your show and which ones you're going to send back to their seats. 
When you use a suggestibility test, don't allow people to go back to their seat thinking that they can't be hypnotized. This could cause them to dismiss the possibility of trying hypnotherapy in future and may result in unnecessary suffering. Ideally, you should tell everyone that you're only selecting those people that are suitable for the style of hypnosis that you're going to use. And there are many, many different ways that you can hypnotize someone. Those that you send back to their seats can still be hypnotized, but they would suit an induction that might take a little bit longer. Now, if you make the suggestion that you are keeping the volunteers that you have selected because they all demonstrate signs that indicate that they would go into trance very quickly, then you are indirectly suggesting to your volunteers that they're going to do exactly that. And this is a really handy little trick. Now, of course, you can also say that you've got far too many volunteers. So some people are not going to get the chance to experience hypnosis this time. Before we get into the tests, I need to very quickly talk about the way you deliver your suggestions. One of the most important factors of hypnotic language is the way that you come across to the subject. You must appear completely confident, even if you don't feel it. Now, this is more important than I could possibly make you realize. So before we start, I need you to get confident. You're going to have to fake it until you make it, but make sure you do it. So what follows is a very quick tip that you can use so that you feel completely confident very, very quickly in any situation. To start off, put your shoulders back, stick your chin out and hold your head high. Now clench your fists and then march around the room in a very, very deliberate fashion. As you do this, I want you to imagine that you are wearing a very bright red cape and this is draped around your shoulders. As you march around the room, feel the cape pulling your shoulders back as it drags across the floor behind you. Also, I'd like you to imagine a fanfare of trumpets that are announcing that you have arrived. Hear the rhythmic beat of marching drums as you stride confidently around the room. Visualize yourself as a powerful Roman emperor. Bang your chest with your clenched fists and punch the sky and allow a very booming yes to bellow from your powerful lungs. Now, breathe in that power. Breathe in that confidence and feel it every time you do hypnosis. I can't express how incredibly important this is, so make sure that you take the time to do it. I used to do this very quick, very simple exercise just behind the wings every time I did a show. Just allow yourself to build that confidence up and then breathe it in. If you appear to be unsure of yourself, weak or nervous or confused, your subject will very, very probably not go into trance. Now, when I first hypnotized Mark, I was incredibly lucky, but I soon discovered that I had to create a very powerful, confident persona if I was to continue to enjoy success. A lack of a confident attitude, even a faked one, is the number one reason that amateur hypnotists don't find it incredibly easy to hypnotize people, which it is when you do it correctly. By doing this simple exercise and projecting a sense of confidence when you hypnotize people, you are catapulting your skills way past almost every other hypnotist in the world. It really is worth the extra effort. And one last word on confidence. As I record these sessions for you, I know that Nathan Thomas, who is a very, very well respected young hypnotist who I greatly admire, is currently developing a brand new hypnosis course. It's called The Confident Hypnotist, and it specifically focuses on this very issue. So if you feel you need a bit more of a confidence boost, you might want to check that out. By the time you're listening to this session, I imagine they'll already be ready on his website. And from what I've seen so far, it looks like that course is going to be amazing. So it's certainly worth checking this one out. Nathan's website, if you want to take a look, is nathanthomashypnosis.com. So you can pop over there and have a look at that course if it's ready. Anyway, back to the matter at hand. Now that you should be brimming with confidence, we're going to get back to those suggestibility tests and we're going to discover which of your volunteers are going to be the very, very best for your show. From this point forward, please only listen to this recording when it would be safe for you to go into a trance. Although this recording doesn't actually hypnotize you, there are many examples of very, very powerful hypnotic techniques and language patterns. There are also embedded commands which will encourage someone to go into trance. So while you're listening to this, 
It's very important you only do so when it would be safe if you were to fall asleep. That's always a good measure with hypnosis. If it's not safe to fall asleep, it's usually not safe to be hypnotized. So if you're in your car, turn this off and come back to it later. As with all the scripts in this book, the script that's about to follow contains embedded commands which are designed to communicate directly with the subject's subconscious mind. Now these need to be emphasized by a shift in tonality. You should practice different ways to emphasize the commands until they sound completely natural. Now the most effective way to deliver these commands is by using a slightly lower and slightly more forceful tonality. This shift only needs to be very subtle and this makes it very suggestive. Your goal is to communicate the message to your subject's subconscious mind without them becoming consciously aware of the command itself. So in other words, don't let the guard catch you. Now the easiest way to do this is to think of the embedded commands as exactly that, commands. In normal conversation, we naturally use a different tonality when we command someone to do something. So experiment with that a little so you can hear the difference. Become increasingly aware of the subtle variations in tone as you speak. For example, commands sound completely different to questions. Questions tend to rise in tonality towards the end and they have a sense of uncertainty about them. This is not what you want. The command tonality does exactly the opposite. It drops a little in pitch towards the end and it sounds more authoritarian in nature. Commands project a sense of confidence and competence. Now this sub-communication is very, very powerful. Focusing on your tonality is what transforms a really basic induction into an irresistible one. You should practice reading out the scripts with a great deal of emphasis on the commands, as though you are a drill sergeant giving orders to your troops. When you use the scripts on your subjects, you will need to tone it down a little. Remember, you don't want to be too obvious. By doing this simple exercise, you're going to be able to train your brain to be able to switch into that command tonality at the right points during the induction. Now, this will automatically deliver your powerful embedded commands straight to your subject's subconscious mind, which is pretty cool. Now onto the scripts. First of all, we're going to be looking at the hands magnets test. Now there's a very subtle suggestion going on here, so I want you to do this very carefully. The purpose of this test is to get your subject's hands to move inwards and then lock together with their fingers interlaced. So you're gonna demonstrate this movement to them. But once you've demonstrated how you want them to hold their hands, close your hands together, lock your fingers, keep them locked together as you lower your hands and then pull them apart as though they're slightly stuck. Now don't make this movement too obvious. If you ask a person afterwards to copy what you just did, they shouldn't even have noticed that your hands went together. Just do it casually as you lower your hands. This will act as an additional visual suggestion to their subconscious mind that will increase the effectiveness of the test. So, Instruct your subject to put their arms out in front of them with their palms facing together and demonstrate the position as you tell them to do this by doing what we've just discussed. Then continue with the following dialogue. In the next few moments, as I count from one to three, I want you to imagine that your hands are powerful magnets. As you hear me count, you will feel an irresistible force pulling your hands together. Each time you feel this force now, it will grow stronger and stronger. And should you attempt to try to resist it, you will find that the more you attempt to try to resist the feeling that your hands are being pulled closer and closer together, the more powerful the force is becoming. You may even be able to feel it now. One, two, three. Three, you can begin to feel it now as the powerful magnets begin to move your hands closer together now. Stronger and stronger, closer and closer. One, two, three, that powerful magnetic force getting so strong now. And the more you attempt to try to resist it, the stronger it becomes. One, two, three, that's good. Closer and closer, just let it happen now. Closer and closer. As you feel the magnets move your hands closer and closer together now, you can prepare yourself to interlace your fingers when your hands touched. Closer and closer now, more and more powerful. The strong magnets move your hands closer and closer together now. When you go through that script, you should time your suggestions according to the subject's response. If you are hypnotizing many people, then just go with the majority. And when they are almost touching, continue with the following. If they move, but don't touch at all, you can just push them together and then go on to the hand locking test. If they don't move at all, 
Let the volunteer know that you have too many volunteers and they won't be needed tonight. But as we said earlier, make sure they know that using a different type of hypnosis, they can still enjoy the benefits of hypnosis, but they're not gonna go into trance fast enough using your techniques for the purposes of your show. Now continue with the following. That's good, closer and closer now, as you interlock your fingers, clasping your hands tighter together now, tighter and tighter now, as you interlock your fingers tightly together. From this point, it's really easy to move straight into the hand locking routine that we're gonna discuss in a few moments. Now the hand magnets test is incredibly useful because it clearly demonstrates which people are the most suggestible volunteers. So make a mental note of the two or three people whose hands touch first, because you're gonna to wanna to use these people for the first few routines after your show, after you've done a few group suggestions that deepen the entire trance state. Now the hand locking test that we're gonna do next is a really fantastic way of discovering which of your subjects are the most flamboyant. Now this is really useful information because a lot of your routines solely depend on your subject's reaction. A really popular routine is to give someone a pair of comedy glasses and tell them these are x-ray glasses and they'll be able to see the entire audience naked. Now this routine completely relies on their reaction when they try on the glasses. If they go over the top when they try to unstick their hands, they are very likely to be very entertaining when they try on the x-ray specs. The hand locking test. Now, as we've already said in the last session, this one follows on beautifully from the hand magnets test. However, if you've not just done that, then you wanna get all your subjects to put their hands out in front of them with their fingers interlaced and their palms pressed tightly together. It doesn't really matter if their eyes are open or closed, but if they're open, have them concentrate on their hands and continue with the following dialogue. As you sit with your hands held together, I want you to squeeze them tighter and tighter together. You are squeezing them so tightly that they become as one. Your hands are stuck tightly together now, tighter and tighter together. If you attempt to try to unstick your hands, you will find that the more you attempt to try to pull them apart, the stronger they become stuck now. Stronger and stronger stuck, getting tighter and tighter. You may even feel glue oozing through your fingers as they become stuck completely together as one. When I count to three, I want you to attempt to try to unstick those hands. But the more you try, the harder it will become. As you attempt to try to unstick those hands, they become locked together, tighter and tighter now, as though they are one, as though they are carved from a solid block of wood. One, two, three. Attempt to try to unstick those hands and find that they become tighter and tighter locked now. You should only allow a few seconds for your volunteers to battle with the task before you tell them to stop trying and just relax, allowing their hands to come to rest in their lap. As I've already mentioned, rather than demonstrating which volunteers to use for your show, the hand locking test demonstrates which of those volunteers are going to be the stars of your show. So look out for the people who go completely over the top as they struggle to release their hands because these people are the exhibitionists and they'll prove to be very, very entertaining later. Now the hand locking dialogue should be spoken in the same manner as the hand magnet dialogue. Don't let the subjects try to release their hands for too long and once you have conducted the test, make sure that you release the subject's hands for them. The next test, which is very, very similar to this one, is the eye catalepsy test. And this is where you stick somebody's eyes closed. Now I'm not gonna go through that here because it is discussed later on in the book when we go through the actual induction process for real. But I wanna tell you a couple of things about these tests. You're not just using this to decide which volunteers to use for your show and which ones are gonna be the exhibitionists, but there's also a hidden benefit of these tests. When you do one of these tests on somebody and it works, they don't think that they've been tested to see if they can be hypnotized. They immediately think they have already been hypnotized because you've told them you're gonna stick their hands together or stick their eyes closed and then they can't release their hands or they can't open their eyes. Now that's unusual, that's not normal behavior. So they will believe you've already done something to them. Now many years ago, when I was first practicing hypnosis, I had hypnotized a friend of mine and I was standing to his side and I told him that his eyes were stuck shut. I'd never hypnotized this particular guy before and he thought it was all nonsense. So once I told him his eyes were stuck closed, he wanted to prove to me that hypnosis was nonsense. So he turned to face me and opened his eyes, but his eyes didn't open. His eyebrows went up, but his eyes remained closed. At this point, he then took his hands and tried to 
open his eyes physically with his hands. He tried to pull his eyelids open and he couldn't. And at that point he was like, what have you done to me? What have you done to my eyes? This is the moment where he suddenly thought, hey, this hypnosis works. I'm in trance, I've been affected by this. So this is really powerful stuff. Bear in mind earlier when I said that people can always hear your voice and at the end of a hypnotic session they may not believe they've been hypnotized because it wasn't what they expected. If you do one of these tests, if you say you can't separate your hands and they can't or your eyes are glued shut and they can't open them, after the session if they go away and somebody says oh what was it like and they'll say well they glued my eyes closed they're going to believe they were definitely hypnotized now when you get on to doing hypnotherapy these kind of suggestions and this kind of proof makes your hypnotic suggestions more effective because if they're thinking i must have been hypnotized because i couldn't even open my eyes then they're going to be more open to accept all the other suggestions that you gave them the arm rotating test for this one, have all of your volunteers put their left arm out in front of them with their hand open and their palm facing down. Now place a coin on the back of each hand and instruct them to concentrate on it. This is an additional bonus because it narrows down their focus of attention, which as you'll see later, is one of the things that lead to hypnosis. Now as they do this, suggest that their arm is beginning to rotate and continue with the following script. Your arm is unsteady. It will begin to rotate. It will initially feel this in your shoulder and this will cause your arm to rotate. As it does, your hand will start to rotate. And the more you attempt to try to resist this, the more that hand turns now. You should continue with similar suggestions until the coin falls to the floor. When the coin drops, the look on the faces of the subjects is a mixture of surprise and bafflement. Now there's a couple of points I want to point out on this one. The use of the word that, you'll say that hand, and this disassociates it from the person, so it feels like something outside of them, something they don't really have control of. Now personally, I'm not really too keen on this one. It's a little bit messy. You have to chase the coins around the floor just to make sure nobody slips over on them later. But it is kind of handy to have in your hypnotic toolbox for those moments, of which there are going to be many, when people learn that you're a hypnotist and they want you to show them something or put them under. Now as with the hand magnets test, the order in which the coins drop will show you which people are the most suggestible. And if after a few minutes there are still a few people who don't respond, you can thank them for volunteering and send them back to their seats telling them you've already got enough volunteers or they're not particularly suited to this kind of hypnosis. But as we've already said, make sure they know they can still be hypnotized using a different kind of hypnosis that you're not going to be doing today. The fallback test. Now I've got to say that this is one of my favorite. It's got to be the most impressive and it's really, really useful. Like the other tests, you can use it to lead straight into trance, but it just feels more natural when you do it with this one. You do have to make sure you've got enough room though because the person will be falling backwards. So you've got to make sure they're not going to bang their head on anything and you need to support their weight. This test looks so slick. It makes you feel pretty cool and it's what everybody expects. So you're going to need to add this one to your hypnotic repertoire. To do it, you simply stand behind your volunteer, get them to close their eyes and then put your hand on their shoulders and gently rock them backwards and forwards. Then you continue with this script. In the next few moments, you will begin to feel a force pulling you backwards towards me. I am directly behind you. I will not let you fall. If you begin to topple over backwards, as you feel this force now, just let it happen, as I will catch you. Feel the magnetic force pulling you back now. Imagine your body begin to gently rock as you feel yourself being pulled towards my voice. The force is pulling on your shoulders now. It is pulling you back towards me, back, back, back towards the sound of my voice. You cannot resist this force. And the more you attempt to try to resist it, the stronger the force is pulling you back now, pulling you back, back, back. And you are safe as you begin to sway as I am right here and I will catch you, pulling you back, back, back towards my voice. As before, continue with suggestions of this nature until the subject falls back into you. When they do, you can either catch them and then stand them back up again, or better still, you can flow into a very, very slick and quick induction. As they fall back onto you, position yourself so their head will come to rest on your shoulder with your mouth close to their ear. For this to flow nicely, you need to reach your hand around the side of their head so you're kind of hugging them as they fall backwards. Then, 
At the moment they fall, place your finger in the center of their brow and quickly tilt their head back onto your shoulder. This will cause their ear to be in the position right close to your mouth and as this happens you can command them to sleep. Now this rapid induction works for a few reasons. It is incredibly disorientating and that sudden jolt backwards is very, very unexpected. This causes the confused volunteer to temporarily suspend their conscious mind while trying to make sense of the situation. At this point, you give them the command to sleep and this slips straight past the critical factor who is fumbling around trying to make sense of what's just happened. It gets accepted by the subconscious mind and they go directly into trance. Now, we're going to go into rapid inductions in a lot more detail later, but I wanted to just quickly mention this one here because it flows so nicely on from the fallback test. However, for your first inductions, I suggest that you use a progressive relaxation script. And this is what we're going to discuss in the next session. How to induce the hypnotic state. The actual trance induction is a whole lot easier than most people imagine. There are so many ways to produce the desired outcome. Some are really easy, some are a little bit more difficult, some are more reliable, and some are way more impressive to watch. The best way to go about learning any new subject is to learn each step in the process piece by piece. Practice each step before you move on to the next one. Now this is never truer than in the process of becoming a confident and successful hypnotist. Now that said, by following my instruction, you will be able to induce the trance state right from the very beginning. However, you will very gradually, through practice of the individual components of the induction sequence, be able to reach the desired state at greater speeds and with an increasing success rate. What we're going to do to start off is to learn a relatively basic induction and then we're going to layer into that with more advanced techniques. This means when you very first start, you're going to be able to hypnotize some people but not everyone because different people respond to hypnosis in different ways. For some people, you have to be kind of crafty and a little bit tricky and you have to put a little bit more effort into it. For others, they go into trance almost immediately no matter what you do. So we'll learn the basic bones first of all, and then we're gonna flesh it out. So in the very next session, we are going to learn your first induction script, the progressive relaxation technique. The progressive relaxation hypnotic induction technique. Now the first induction process that we're going to look at is the progressive relaxation technique. And as its name suggests, this technique relies on the volunteer progressively relaxing until such a time when they allow you access through their critical factor into their subconscious mind. The basic procedure is very, very simple. You help the subject to relax by direct instruction. The power of the progressive relaxation induction is greatly enhanced by using carefully structured language patterns. Now I'm going to avoid at this stage actually giving you the induction script and simply tell you the basic principles. Learning each component of the induction script this way will increase your success and greatly reduce the time required for you to develop as a competent hypnotist. Now a word for word induction script is included later that you are well advised to use for your first induction. Hypnotic language. The basic goal of the progressive relaxation induction is to get the subject to relax. But to simply say relax your body is not descriptive enough. Many people have forgotten how to relax and your job is to re-educate them. To relax the body as a whole is a very difficult thing to do. The easiest way to overcome this problem is to start at one end of the body and then slowly work your way along it. It doesn't matter if you start at the head or the feet, the basic principle to both is exactly the same. Now I tend to favour starting at the top of the body, as it seems to me to be a little more logical to progress from asking the subject to close your eyes, to then suggest relax all the tiny muscles in and around your eyes, as opposed to now relax each and every toe. Now, I always begin a progressive relaxation induction by asking the subject just to take three deep breaths. This alone can relieve a great deal of tension. After this, you can go on to suggest that the subject is getting more and more sleepy. These words alone will receive some response from your subject, but it is the way that you say the words that is the real magic. Whenever you induce trance, use a confident, authoritative and reassuring tone and make sure that you speak a little bit more slowly than you usually do. 
it's very effective to start your induction at your normal talking speed and then gradually reduce it as the subject becomes more relaxed. Now, I usually speak quite fast and as a result, I'm often asked to repeat myself. When I start the induction, I speak slightly slower than usual so as not to cause confusion or misunderstanding. But by the time I've reached the end of the induction, I find that I'm talking much, much slower. While inducing the trance state, it is also affected to emphasize your words. Whenever you're going to say, for example, as you go deeper into trance, the key word here is deeper. So what could be more effective than to put a great deal more emphasis on this word? You can emphasize a word in many, many ways. Firstly, don't just say deeper into trance, say deeper and deeper into trance. This alone is a lot more powerful, but of course it doesn't end there. If you split the word slightly, so the deep part and the per part become separated, and then you say the per section in a slightly deeper tonality. This will cause the subject's relaxation to follow this drop, and they will go into a deeper state. Another little trick is to drag out your words. This will add additional emphasis. Now, although this is very, very simple, this tiny factor will produce a much greater response. So what we started out with is you are going deeper into trance, and now we have you are going deeper and deeper into trance. When you can drag your commands out like this and add that additional emphasis, it becomes much, much more powerful. Now, as you can see, it doesn't take much imagination to improve your skills. The sentence I've used for this example also harbors a very important message. Although when viewed as a whole, the message is lost, break the sentence down and it suddenly becomes blatantly obvious as you go deeper into trance quite obviously contains the instruction go into trance. Now you can pick this out with your voice tonality and you're creating a subliminal message. Subliminal messages or embedded commands must bypass conscious awareness to be successful. You may very well be thinking, how can something so vague produce such a response? The reason this works is down to your subconscious mind. Now, have you ever been in a room with many people all holding different conversations at the same time. If you have, then you will probably have noticed that if someone is to say your name, you instantly home your attention in on what it is they're saying. If you were to try to consciously listen to each conversation at once, waiting for someone to mention something of interest to you, then it would prove an impossible task. However, such a feat is not only possible for your subconscious mind, it's a continuous occurrence. Your subconscious mind was in fact listening to each and every conversation going on and as soon as your name was mentioned it alerted you to pay attention as it was obviously something that was going to be of concern for you. Now the point here is that your subconscious mind hears everything. So it hears the sentence as you go deeper into trance with emphasis on the words go and into trance, it will link these words together to form a new sentence which will not need to be accepted by the guardian and evaluated before it's either allowed into the subconscious mind or dismissed, as it's the processor of the subconscious mind itself which has in fact created the instruction in the first place. So the processing section of the brain will do all it can to obey the command go into trance. Now, of course, this alone will not induce the hypnotic state. The mind is not as simple as that. It's not a case of black and white, where white is the normal waking, fully conscious state and black is the state of hypnosis. It's more like a vast grey scale, with one end sitting just behind the door of your subconscious and the other end deeply seated in your subconscious mind. The further down that scale your suggestions reach, the more impact they have. Now, with this in mind, do not dismiss subtle suggestions, as they are often much, much more powerful than you would first believe. Sometimes the effects are not immediately obvious, but you can think of your suggestions as seeds planted deep within the mind. At first, nothing seems to happen, but before you know it, the suggestion will flourish. Now, many people immediately associate subliminal messages with negative thoughts of brainwashing. Now, I'm sure you've heard of the famous case where youngsters supposedly sacrificed their lives to the devil due to a suggestion recorded backwards behind heavy metal music. Other famous incidents of subliminal persuasion include the flashing of branded drinks names during cinematic projection, leading to a dramatic increase in sales. Now, Darren Brown utilizes subliminal persuasion beautifully during his paranormal demonstrations, as do many street magicians. 
A subliminal message can be a very, very effective way of producing a desired outcome. It is the operator that chooses the outcome. As a responsible hypnotist, you can make positive use of subliminal persuasion to greatly aid the induction process. A subliminal message can be marked out in many ways. If your subject is looking at you, you could simply raise your eyebrows or use hand gestures on each of the words in your message, allowing their subconscious to pick it out from the rest of the sentence. If your subject has their eyes closed, you will need to change your voice tonality. But don't let the change be too obvious. Remember that it is subtlety that produces power. One of the ways that I often highlight my subliminal messages is to simply turn my head to one side on each word I wish to be picked out. Now consciously, you can't really notice any difference, but at a subconscious level, it's very, very easy to pick out where my voice is coming from in the room, and the message is created and accepted. By making use of what you've learned so far, you will notice a remarkable difference between the two statements as you go deeper into trance, and as you go deeper and deeper deeper into trance. Practice using subliminal messages regularly. You can find the subtle art of subliminal persuasion very, very useful. I often indirectly suggest that someone buys me a drink or perhaps do a mundane chore for me, but be sure not to go over the top. The aim is to practice, not just exploit people. Practicing each component of the hypnotic language in this manner is extremely beneficial as they quickly become part of your everyday language and, naturally, this leads you to concentrate on more important things whilst you're inducing trance. Just remember that at this stage, your subjects are your friends, so if you make them buy you a drink, make sure you offer to buy them one back later. You might very well become the greatest hypnotist that ever lived, but it won't be much fun if you lose all your friends in the process. Linguistic Bridges Linguistic basically means language, and a bridge is just a link, so a linguistic bridge is a word that we use to link our language together. Examples of linguistic bridges are words like and, makes, causes, as, and while. If we use a linguistic bridge to link two statements together, we can increase the power of the second of these messages. Now, when linguistic bridges are used, the first of the two statements is usually something that the subject can immediately identify with. By doing this, you can increase your rapport with the subject, and we're going to cover this in much more detail later. For example, you can feel the weight of your hands in your lap. Now this statement is something that the subject is experiencing now. They can associate with this. If you use a linguistic bridge to link this statement to an effect that you desire, for example, relax deeper, the second of these statements, your relax deeper command, becomes much more powerful. It's simply a case of this is what you're doing now, and this is what I want you to do. Now, linguistic bridges come in three strengths. We've got the weakest bridges, which are words such as and, for example, you are listening to the sound of my voice, and suddenly become strikingly aware of your left foot. On the next level are words such as as, when, during, and while. For example, as you listen to this sentence, you can't help but think of a pink elephant. The strongest level of linguistic bridge contains words like makes, forces, causes, and requires. For example, the fact that you are listening to my voice makes you think of school and getting to the end of this sentence causes you to reminisce over a particular experience you had while you were in school. Linguistic bridges are not only useful of aid in the induction process, but are also very, very easy to administer. When you are inducing trance, the whole process seems to work a lot better if you use the weak level of linguistic bridges at the beginning of the induction, and as your subject slowly drifts towards trance, you go to the second level, and as the trance deepens, also deepen the strength of the linguistic bridge by switching to the third and most powerful level. You may very well be wondering, why don't you use the more powerful linguistic bridges all the way through? I've practiced both methods, and this has revealed that a slow increase in strength is a lot more powerful than strength throughout. Although the reason for this is unknown, it's my guess that the subject, while still slightly aware, is subconsciously conflicting the suggestion. This is quite possible, but for whatever reason, research has shown that one method does work better than the other, so it is best to stick with a method that seems to help the induction process the most. Biofeedback loops. A fantastic method 
of aiding the induction process is to create a biofeedback loop with your subject. To do this, you must first carefully observe the state of the subject. Let's say, for example, that you're giving a stage performance and you've just done some preliminary tests on your subjects and now you wish to begin the trance induction. You can pretty much assume that your subject will be curious about what is about to happen and you know that they're all sitting in a chair. You can use this kind of knowledge to feed back to the subject exactly what it is they are experiencing, then, using what you have learned in the section on linguistic bridges, suggest somewhere for them to go, which is, in this case, usually deeper into trance. Once you've done this, again observe the subject's state relate that back to them, and once again, make a suggestion of where they should go. You can continue with this process until you have directed all of your subjects into a trance state. What you have done is a very simple process, making good use of linguistic bridges to further aid the induction process. If you have an outside distraction while you're inducing the trance state, do not ignore it, hoping that the subject didn't notice it. Remember, the subject's hearing is probably a lot more sensitive than yours at this point. So if you do ignore such a situation, your subject will continue to think about it and they'll be distracted from the trance state. I'm often performing in noisy venues and such incidents crop up regularly. The best way to overcome them is to use a biofeedback loop to actually make the subject go deeper into trance. For example, if somebody bangs their glass onto the bar, you can use this by saying, as you hear the sound of the glass on the bar, this causes you to go deeper and deeper into trance. Simple statements like this make really good use of what would otherwise be a disaster because once you've set them up in this way, any possible distraction instantly becomes a cue to go deeper into trance. It's really useful when you first start the induction process to tell your subjects to focus on your voice, but if they should hear any other sounds or noises, those sounds and noises will cause them to go even deeper into trance. Of course, the exception to this is things like fire alarms when you really need them to wake up, so you do need to put your safeguards in there too, whereas if they hear a noise that indicates an emergency, they'll instantly come back to fully waking consciousness. Metaphors. One of the factors that you have probably noticed which will help get a suggestion accepted is the subtlety with which it is introduced. It is often that the very vague messages that we receive are the ones that we will obey. With this knowledge, you can develop your language to optimize the power of your suggestions. One of the ways that you can do this is through the use of a metaphor. Now, although metaphors don't really play a great part in the induction process, and they're very rarely used on the stage, I feel they should at least be mentioned at this point because we are discussing the hypnotic language and they do play a very, very important role in hypnotherapy. Metaphors can be very, very powerful if they are used carefully. Now, if this subject interests you, it is worth looking at the work of Milton H. Erickson. Erickson was an absolute genius at using metaphors during his therapy. He would often tell his subjects a story, seemingly not related to their condition, and probably viewed as an old man being lonely and friendly. The story, however innocent it seemed, always carried a very strong message for his clients, and the therapy was readily accepted before people even realized it had been administered. Now, a final word on hypnotic language. Not so long ago, it was a common belief that to hypnotize a subject, you must talk in a slow, monotone, dull voice. This does work, but the onset of trance is probably due to boredom rather than the hypnotist's suggestions. This method also takes a great deal of time, so it's not really very useful for the world of stage hypnotists. Remember, as a stage hypnotist, your task is to entertain your audience, not send them to sleep. It is far more successful if you vary the speed and tone of your voice, depending on what it is you're saying. Also, you really need to remember that the subconscious is easy to confuse. It may be able to perform dramatic feats at lightning speed all over your body, but when it comes to processing a hypnotist's instruction, it takes on the characteristics of an infant. You must always keep your hypnotic language very, very simple. Make it so a child can understand it, and you will encounter very few problems. Another point of concern here about hypnotic language is the tone of voice you should use. A useful tonality to adopt would be that of a parent talking to a child. Don't go over the top. You don't want to patronize your subject. Try to alter your tone. Get excited if the induction script sounds exciting. Build up speed at tense moments and slow down as your subject goes deeper. Think of your induction as a movie. At times it's slow and at times it speeds up as the excitement begins to build. 
Overall, you should keep the pace very slow. However, during deepening the trance state, an increase in speed can produce an overwhelming sense of excitement for your subject and greatly aid the entire process. You will find that the subjects are more inclined to allow themselves to let go of reality if they are interested and completely absorbed in what you're saying. You're not allowed to impress your subject with your grasp of the English language. Your goal is to hypnotize them, and to do this, you should make good use of anything that will aid the success and speed of the induction. Rapport, pacing, and leading. As already mentioned, the progressive relaxation induction can be greatly assisted by the use of rapport. But what exactly is rapport? Well, before we get to how we use rapport in hypnosis, I just want to touch on rapport in a social setting. Gaining rapport with people is very, very easy to do. You just subtly copy a few of their actions, their gestures, and you use similar words. Now, this sounds really, really simple, and it is, but it's also very, very effective. The key point, as with most of these techniques, is to be subtle. So you don't want to mimic your subject because they'll quickly become offended when they notice that you're copying everything they do. For example, let's imagine that you're out in a social setting and you want to gain rapport with someone. Say you're sitting opposite someone and you want to establish a sense of rapport with them so you start to subtly copy the things they do. If they take a drink of their drink, don't immediately mimic this by taking a drink of your own, but rather you could lift your hand, scratch your chin, and when they lower their drink, you could lower your hand. If you're trying to gain rapport with someone without them becoming aware, make sure there's no possibility of them noticing that you're watching them. Gaining rapport with people is a very, very effective way of meeting new people and making new friends. When you successfully gained rapport with somebody, they subconsciously notice that you're a very similar person. Their mind seems to come to that suggestion that this person's like me, I must know them. They don't really come up with the suggestion all by themselves, it all happens at a subconscious level, and the whole of the suggestion doesn't make it through to conscious awareness. The only part that does is, I know that person. Eventually, they come over and they try to recall where they think they know you from. Now, how many times has somebody come up to you in a nightclub and says, don't I know you from somewhere? Now at the time, I'm guessing you probably thought it was a cheap chat up line, but perhaps they really did believe they knew you. Now I can hear you probably thinking right now, that may have happened, but when it did happen, I was not out trying to gain rapport with people. I hadn't even heard of rapport. So this may indeed be the case, but rapport is a very natural part of the mating game. We all use it all the time. We use it to gain someone's respect and admiration. In fact, we're naturally so good at gaining rapport already that we're often unaware that we're doing it. The next time you go to a nightclub, watch the people who are dancing. You will easily be able to pick out who's trying to win whose heart because they'll copy each other, they'll follow each other around the dance floor and it really looks like quite an amusing display. But people who like other people naturally gain rapport with them. You see it in the early stages of relationships when people say they like the same kind of music, they like the same kind of pastimes. All they're doing is trying to establish a sense of rapport with the other person. And that's what you can do in hypnosis in order to be able to get a person to like you and to go in the direction you want to take them. So now you've got a little bit more of an understanding of what rapport is, you need to be able to use it to your advantage whenever you hypnotize people. Now, of course, you can always stay at the nightclubs and have a lot of fun practicing gaining rapport on a more social level. But unfortunately, this isn't quite so financially rewarding as performing hypnotic stay shows. One of the things you can do with rapport, which is priceless to the hypnotist, is to pace and lead somebody's breathing. Now, this is very simple, but it's incredibly effective. Now to do this, you don't have to match your breathing to theirs. You could match anything to their breathing. Your voice pattern, you could gently lift and lower your finger as they breathe in and out. Whatever you do, once you've created and established a rapport with their breathing, you can then lead them in a direction. So you can start to lift your finger at a slower pace and they will begin to breathe a little bit more deeply. Now obviously, if you're hypnotizing a few people at once, which is very, very often the case, especially in stage hypnosis, then they're all gonna be breathing at their own rate. This is one of the reasons that you should get people to take three deep breaths right at the beginning, because this is gonna synchronize everyone, and then you can very, very quickly gain a sense of rapport using your tonality or whatever you choose with the breathing that you've set, and then you can lead them in the direction you want them to go. Now we've already established that rapport makes people think they know you, it makes them like you. So why would you want to do this? Well, the simple answer is you don't really need to do it at all. So why is rapport important? Well, on its own, it's not really all that important. Its only function really is to create a kind of bond between the subject and yourself. This makes the subject trust you more and they're much more likely to relax and of course more likely to do what you say. 
This, although not essential, is very, very useful. And it's best to take advantage of any means possible to ensure a quick and successful induction. However, the real beauty of rapport is that once you've created a bond with your subject, they suddenly become your followers. You can create rapport and then, using a process that we call pacing and leading, you can take your subject into a desired state. Now this is priceless to the hypnotist, as I'm sure you've already realised. You're able to first gain rapport with your subject at a conscious level, then, once you've matched their breathing, you can deepen your own breath or slow down whatever it is you've matched to their breathing and they will very shortly follow. This obviously is a great aid to inducing trance. In fact, one induction technique, which I'll go into more detail later, explains how you first you gain rapport with your subject, then slowly begin to hypnotize yourself and watch as they follow. As they enter the trance state, you bring yourself out and simply give them suggestions to go deeper. Now, before we move on to the next ingredient of the hypnotic sequence, I'd like to tell you a little story about a time where I personally used rapport, because this is going to give you a little bit of an idea of how you might like to practice these skills yourself. This happened many, many years ago when I first started to learn hypnosis myself. Now, on one particular occasion, I'd gone to a nightclub with a few friends and we found it to be full. We were all disappointed and we didn't really want to go anywhere else, but we continued on to the next club. Now, my friend, a guy called Craig, had preconceived ideas about the club that we ended up at. He didn't like it and this put him in a very unsociable mood. He wanted to go. I wanted to make the most of it. Now, I hadn't known about rapport very long, but I thought I'd give it a try. So I matched his body posture. I matched his breathing and his lack of energy. I also began to speak about the club the way he was. Now this instantly enabled me to gain rapport with Craig. I'd matched what he was thinking, I was matched what he was doing. Now in a space of around about five or 10 minutes, I then gradually increased my energy level and posture. He began to follow me. And for a change, he actually dragged me onto the dance floor. Now that has never, never happened before. This is a guy who takes a little bit of encouragement to get dancing, but just by changing his energy levels and changing his thoughts on the club by gaining rapport with them and pacing and leading him, he was the one dragging me out onto the dance floor. Now this was a dramatic change of attitude in a very, very short space of time. I would have got absolutely nowhere by simply saying, come on, cheer up, let's make the most of it, and all those kind of things. If you want to practice gaining rapport with people, then a very, very useful exercise is to just sit next to someone and match their breathing. After a while, deepen your breathing and wait to see if they follow. If they don't follow, then simply go back to pacing them again and create a stronger bond and then make a more subtle change in the direction you want to take them. This is a fantastic little exercise to do whenever you're on public transport. Just sit next to someone on a train, pace their breathing and see if you can change their state. See if you can make them fall asleep. But if you do do that, make sure you wake them up again, otherwise they might miss their stop. Fixation of attention. One of the main ingredients to a successful induction is fixation of attention. In fact, you've probably already experienced trance by gazing into the flames of a fire. Over the years, hypnotists have used all kinds of things to induce trance, from candles to electronic lights and spinning discs. And of course, most famously, the swinging pocket watch. The Scottish eye doctor, James Braid, is most famously recognised as the first person to induce trance using fixation of attention. Now he stumbled upon this phenomena when he noticed that one of his patients appeared to have entered an altered state whilst gazing at the pinpoint reflections of a polished brass lamp. Now Braid tried a few experiments with simple suggestions and the results were very encouraging. These days, Bray's discovery plays a very, very important part in the onset of trance. To create fixation of attention quickly in your subjects, get them to focus their vision on a point on the ceiling. This not only limits their attention, so guiding them towards trance, but it also does another very, very useful thing. When we fix our vision on a point above the normal eye level, our eyes quickly become tired and heavy. This is very useful to the hypnotist, as when the eyes close, it serves as a signal to the subject that the trance process is beginning to work. Once the eyes are closed, you can get the subject to fixate their attention on a thought. This is usually the task of counting backwards in their minds. You can also suggest that the further back they count, the deeper into trance this will take them. Fixation of attention can be upon something as simple as the subject's own breathing, and by combining this train of thought with the suggestion of relaxation and using linguistic bridges, you're able to produce a very powerful induction script. The Progressive Relaxation Induction 
On the following session, I'm going to give you a word-for-word -word induction script. Now, I've used this script and similar ones many, many times in the past to hypnotize hundreds of people. I don't use scripts anymore. I simply make up my induction as I go along, which is where I expect you to be very, very soon. I've included the script so you can make good use of it as you begin to experiment with hypnosis. It's written exactly as it should be read, word for word, without interruption. What I'd like you to do is to read through this script several times and listen to the next audio track, which is me reading through the script for you, so you can pick out the individual components that we've already discussed. What you should be able to do is to notice the different parts of the hypnotic language so that you can start to create your own scripts. After the script, you're going to find a complete breakdown so that I'll explain what every single sentence does, why you have to say it, how you have to say it, and why it's an important factor in putting someone into a deep trance. You should familiarize yourself with the basics of the script, and then at the end of the chapter, you'll find instructions on how you can develop your own hypnotic inductions. The Progressive Relaxation Script now before I start, I need to tell you this script is written as though you're inducing trance in a few people rather than just one. It will work equally well on one subject, but you will need to tweak it to suit your circumstances. Throughout the induction, you will notice that I talk to the crowd or I talk to the volunteers. When you're talking to the crowd, whatever you're saying to them, obviously the subjects can hear that. So quite often you can use subliminal messages and embedded commands by saying things to the crowd about what's going to happen in the show. So let's get started. Firstly, I would like to thank the subjects that have volunteered tonight. You, the crowd, are about to witness the trance induction, a very rare and privileged sight to be able to see. The sensations that the subjects will go through are even more fascinating for the volunteers than the spectacle it produces for you, the audience. Entering the hypnotic state is a very relaxing and pleasurable sensation that few people ever get to experience. Now turn to the subjects. You have all come up here tonight with one intention in mind, to experience hypnosis. Now I don't know if you will go into trance quickly or take a little longer to really enjoy all the pleasant experiences that trance has to offer. Trance is completely natural. Every day people go into trance at least twice. You enter the hypnotic state as you wake in the morning and again at the end of the night as you go to sleep. You also go into trance throughout the day many many times. Have you ever driven home and completely forgotten the route that you took? This is a mild level of trance that we all regularly experience. The only difference between when you go into trance naturally and when you go into trance with the aid of a hypnotist is that you don't usually have someone giving you a direction to follow. Now, before we begin, I would like you to just spread your seats out a little. Ensure that you're not touching anyone that's next to you. That's fine. Also, if anybody is wearing a tight belt or has their shoelaces done up tight, just loosen those a little. When you go into trance, your body will relax and a tight melt may become uncomfortable. That's great. Before we begin the induction process, I'd like to make a couple of points clear. Firstly, I am not going to make anybody strip. So throughout the entire show, you will remain fully clothed. And secondly, if any of you have any fears or worries that you might not wake up, you need not worry about this at all, as to awaken a hypnotized subject is as easy as counting to three and saying wide awake. If anything happens to me while you are hypnotized, you will either wake spontaneously, get bored with whatever I've asked you to do, or drift into a natural sleep and wake in the usual manner. Although many people believe you can become stuck in hypnosis, it is impossible to become stuck in hypnosis. Of course, you know that when you go to sleep at night, you will wake in the morning. You don't know how you do it, but you trust that you will. So, as you sit in your chair, with your hands resting in your lap, perhaps you are wondering how it is that you are going to go into trance. I would like you to rest your feet flat on the floor, keep your legs uncrossed, and unless I say otherwise, keep your hands resting in your lap. That's fine. Now, as an exercise, we are going to relax your body. I will help you to do this, and to begin, I would like you to close your eyes. Now take three deep breaths. Breathe in, hold it for a second, and breathe out. And as you do, allow any tension to flow out of your body. And again, breathe in, hold it for a second, and now breathe out. And as that warmer breath leaves your mouth or your nostrils, you can feel the tension flowing away from you. 
And just once more, breathe in, hold it for a second, and now breathe out, allowing your shoulders to drop a little as you do. That's fine. Now I want to draw your attention to your eyes. Imagine your eyes closing down again. As you do this, your eyelids are getting heavier and heavier. That's fine. Simply imagine your eyes closing down again, all by themselves, as your eyelids are becoming heavier and heavier. Your eyes are closing down tighter and tighter now, and should you attempt to try to open them, they will remain tightly glued shut. I don't want you to try to open your eyes just yet. Simply feel them, getting tighter and tighter as it starts to get darker. Your eyes are sealed shut tight, stuck down tight. Some of you may even imagine glue holding your eyelids closed tightly now. Your eyes are stuck now, stuck hard, tighter and tighter. When I count to three, I want you to attempt to try to unstick your eyes. The more you try, the harder it gets. Stuck down tightly now. When I count to three, I want you all to repeat in your mind, my eyes are tightly glued shut. My eyes are tightly glued shut. As you attempt to try to unstick them now. One, two, three. Try as you might to unstick your eyes. The harder you try, the tighter they become. Tighter and tighter, stuck closed. Okay, relax and stop trying to open your eyes. The glue is all gone and your eyes are comfortable. We are going to begin to slow everything right down now. As you listen to the sound of my voice, you can allow yourself to go into trance. Relax the tiny muscles around your eyes and imagine them closing again. Now feel that wonderful relaxed sensation beginning to spread down your face and relax the tiny muscles in and around your jaw. That's fine. Check to make sure that your jaw is not clamped up shut and just relax your jaw and allow your mouth to fall freely and comfortably open. As you relax the tiny muscles around your mouth, you can feel your whole face ease a little and begin to soften. Imagine this feeling of relaxation as a colour that is slowly spreading over your face. You can see this colour in your mind as it begins to soak into your cheekbones and jaw, bringing a wonderful relaxing sensation with it as it does. Now, visualise this colour as the sensation begins to creep into your neck. You can feel the wonderful colour soaking into your neck, slowly spreading down to your shoulders. You can drop your shoulders a little more with each out breath. And as you do, this allows you to breathe a little more deeply than you normally do. That's fine. Taking you deeper and deeper into trance. As that colour slowly creeps down your arms, taking that wonderful sensation of warmth and relaxation with it. Creeping down your arms now and slowly being absorbed by every muscle in your arms, soaking into the bones as you go into trance. Now, the wonderful relaxing colour has reached your hands. And here we can relax your hands. That's fine. And now the first trick in physical relaxation is to relax each and every finger in turn. Because if your fingers are relaxed, your arms must be. So as I pause for the first time, just imagine the wonderful relaxing colour spreading down to the tip of each and every finger. That's fine. Now your arms are completely relaxed. And once again, you can bring your attention to your shoulders. Feel the tension released as you drop your shoulders a little with each deep, relaxing and warm out breath until they feel quite free. Now, That sensation, that colour, that relaxing experience is beginning to drift down your body, flowing down through your chest, down deeper 
and deeper as it soaks into you. You can allow your body to simply drift off, drifting down into a nice, comfortable, relaxing state. That's fine. Now, as that colour begins to soak into your stomach, you can feel your stomach relax and listening only to the sound of my voice. You know that there are no embarrassments between us now. And safe in this knowledge, you allow your stomach to relax completely. As we approach the second trick in the relaxation process, because if your stomach is relaxed, then the entire of your torso must also be. So as I pause for a second time, allow your stomach to relax completely. That's fine. As that wonderful sensation begins to spread down your legs, you can visualize that color as it begins to soak deeper and deeper into your body, flowing down into your legs now. And as it does, you can allow your thighs to relax as though you've been running. And now it's time for you to rest. And as you rest, you can visualize that color soaking deep into your bones and taking that wonderful, warm, relaxing sensation with it allowing you to drift on down deeper and deeper into trance. That colour now slowly soaking into your calf muscles. As it begins to spread down towards your feet, you can feel that relaxing sensation flowing and the colour is now soaking into your feet and your feet are becoming more and more relaxed. And as this sensation sits at the very bottom of your person, your whole body is relaxed and your mind can relax too. Your body is completely relaxed. I don't want you to lose awareness of your body just yet. Simply bathe in this wonderfully relaxing experience that we call the hypnotic state. Now, I would like you to focus your attention on your feet. Look at your feet in your mind's eye. And as you do so, this causes the color of relaxation to slowly begin to glow out from your feet. This color is beginning to get brighter and brighter, and as it glows outwards in a magical haze, it also soaks inwards, increasing that sensation of relaxation as it does, glowing brighter and brighter now, and as I count from 1 to 10, it will race up your body, a pulsating glow of bright sensual color, racing up your body as I count, taking with it all the relaxation that you have ever experienced, one, that colour is spreading into your legs, engulfing your calf muscles as it does. Two, pushing its way up now, entering your thighs and bringing with it the most sensational experience of relaxation that you have ever experienced. Three, rushing up into your stomach now. Four, racing up towards your torso. Five, bursting into your chest and as that glow gets brighter and brighter. Six, engulfing your shoulders now in a wonderful, exciting sensation. Seven, rushing down your arms and taking that sensation all the way past your elbows. Eight, filling each and every finger now, from the skin to the bone and glowing from your fingertips. Nine, as that sensation spreads into your neck and sends a wonderful experience up into the back of your skull. And ten, that colour finally races around each side of your head as it crashes together at the front of your face. It encapsulates your whole body. Now, it is getting brighter and brighter and it glows even bigger and bigger as it begins to race out from your body, bursting out and racing across the room, filling the whole room with that wonderful relaxing colour. The colour is all around you, it is soaking into you, it is glowing out from you. You are breathing it in and you are breathing it out. When I count to three, in the next few moments, all of that colour 
that has burst out and filled the room and beyond will race back to your body. And as your body absorbs every last drop of this fantastic experience, it takes you to a level higher and further than you've ever experienced before. One, two, and three. That color is rushing back to your body now and bringing with it a sensational sensation. All that color is now deep within you. And as I count down from three to one, it will cause your body to relax deeper than it has ever been relaxed before. Three, getting deeper, two, and deeper, one, and deeper, down, 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 deeper, and deeper into trance, deeper, and deeper into trance, that's fine. Now as you listen to the sound of my voice, it will take you into trance. And as you hear these words that I am saying, I want you to imagine that you are standing at the top of a beautiful flight of stairs. That's fine. I want you to look down the stairs now in your mind's eye. You can keep your eyes closed as you do this. Just look down those stairs. There are 10 stairs to this staircase. And as I slowly count down from 10 to 1, you will slowly walk down the staircase, taking another step each time I say another number. This staircase is the staircase of relaxation, and each step down that you take causes you to go deeper and go deeper into trance. Look down that staircase now, and you will notice on the right hand side is a banister. As you walk down the staircase I want you to hold the banister in your mind. You will find that you can do this mentally and imagine your hand holding that banister and you can actually reach out and grab hold of it now. As I begin to count you will begin to slowly walk down the staircase of relaxation. Ten. That's fine. Take your first step down the staircase of relaxation. Nine, another step down. And as you can feel yourself going deeper and deeper. Eight, deeper and deeper down the staircase of relaxation. Seven, and as you take another step, you become aware of the temperature of the staircase. Six, deeper and deeper down, causing you to go deeper and deeper into trance. Five, you are halfway down the staircase now. And at the bottom you can see a relaxing white mist is beginning to form. Four, as the mist at the bottom of the stairs gets thicker. This causes you to go deeper and deeper into trance. Three, you can notice the feeling of the stairs beneath your feet and this feeling takes you deeper and deeper into trance. Two, as that cloud of relaxing sensual mist at the bottom of the stairs continues to grow, it causes you to go deeper and deeper into trance. And one, you're at the bottom of the stairs now, and all around you is this wonderful mist. Although you cannot see it yet, in front of you is a door. And in a moment you are going to go through this door. When I count to three, I want you to take a deep breath in. And breathe in all that relaxing mist. One. Two. And three. Breathe in. That's fine. And hold it for just a second. And now breathe out. And as you do... That mist, that colour, drifts out of your body and floats away, taking any remaining tension that you still had with it, and leaving the area where you are standing clear and pure. 
In front of you, there is a door. I want you to go to this door now. That's fine. And when I count to three, you will reach out and grasp the handle and open the door. And once you have, you will walk inside and close the door behind you. As soon as you are inside the room, you will see a bright white spotlight shining straight in your eyes. It will make you squint down hard as you will protect your eyes from this bright light by covering them with your hands. One, two, three. Reach out and open the door and go inside. And you can see that bright shining spotlight glaring into your eyes. Squint down hard as you try to protect yourself from the blinding light by covering your eyes with your hands. When I click my fingers, the light will go out and it will go dark again. And you will leave the room and close the door behind you. One, two, three. All gone now. It's okay. Leave the room and close the door. And as you do, you will go twice as deep into trance. Now at this point, your subjects will all be deep in hypnosis and you can commence with your show. However, it is best to keep on the safe side and do a couple of simple routines first that involve everybody before you go for the more dramatic ones. Later on in the book, you will find a list of routines that you can use and these are all categorized to help you put your show together successfully. Once you've completed your routines, you must then awaken your volunteers. Now, awaking someone from trance is very, very easy. You can simply say, one, two, three, eyes open, wide awake, and back in the room. But it's always best to awaken your subjects on a high. To do this, you can use affirmations. Now, all this is explained for you later in the book, and any problems that you may encounter whilst waking your volunteers are also discussed later. The Progressive Relaxation Script Review. The first thing worth mentioning about the script that you've just gone through is that it starts out with a brief explanation of trance and then comes to a simple waking test, which in this case was the eyes locking test. This is followed by the actual induction process and then comes two forms of deepening trance, the rush of color up the body and the staircase of relaxation. The section right at the end of the induction about the bright light in the room is actually the first routine of the show. I often start with this routine as most people respond to it and it deepens the trance state. The very beginning of the script holds a great deal of suggestion in the form of subliminal messages and embedded commands. Now as you read through this script, I've highlighted all of these in capitals for you so you can easily pick them out and you need to emphasize these as you read the script. I will point out the rest of the script's components using notes throughout. Each component of the induction will be explained in full, and if a section of the script holds no such component or subliminal message, I'll simply leave it out. The speech that I give right at the beginning, the one that's directed at the audience, serves a great purpose in making the actual subjects want to experience trance. Because it's not aimed directly at the subjects, they will not notice it as a message to them, and due to this, will be all the more willing to comply. Next comes the sentence, I don't know if you will go into trance quickly or take a little longer to really enjoy the pleasant experiences that trance has to offer. As well as the subliminal message to go into trance quickly, this statement also implies that trance is a pleasant experience, again making the volunteers want to experience it. Also, this clever little suggestion implies that they're actually going to go into trance. They'll go into trance very quickly or it's going to take them a little bit longer and they're going to enjoy the process. It doesn't suggest that they might not go into trance, so it's a very, very clever and really simple thing to include. The following section, which goes on to explain how we all enter trance at least twice daily and that trance is completely natural, has the phrase go into trance included in it several times and all of these need to be emphasized. It also has the phrase, at the end of the night as you go to sleep. This embedded command relies on the belief that trance is similar to, if not the same as, sleep. Now, this section also reassures the subject that what they're about to do is nothing to worry about because they've done it so many times before. The next step, where I tell everybody to spread out their seats and loosen their belts and shoes, serves the purpose of getting their subconscious mind used to accepting orders from me and obeying them. 
Now this is very powerful and very important, so don't overlook it. When you set up the seats on the stage, put them close together, actually put them touching each other, so they physically have to move them and they're obeying your commands. Now when I'm doing hypnotherapy, I often say to the person sitting in the chair having hypnotherapy, just pull your chair forward a little away from the wall. Serves exactly the same purpose. It conditions them into simply obeying your commands without question. The next section, which explains that I'm not going to make anybody strip, and also mentions the wake-up process, is to reassure the subjects and allow them to let go a little. The subjects will also be more willing to trust themselves in my hands after this point. The sentence that contains the phrase, to awaken a hypnotized subject, also presumes that they're all going to be hypnotized subjects, making you look more confident and giving the volunteers a greater belief that you can actually do it. The next section establishes rapport with the subject, with the simple statement, sitting on your chair and hands resting in your lap. It also contains a presumption, wondering how it is that you're going to go into trance. Now, this is recognized as mind reading by the subject and gains you credibility. As well as the obvious subliminal message, the statement also assumes the subject is going to go into trance. The only question is how? Next in this paragraph is the instruction to not fold their arms and to keep their feet flat on the floor. This is also an order, which serves the same principle as moving the chairs. The subjects will find it more easy to relax in this position, and of course if you've ever studied body language, crossing your arms or crossing your legs can act as a little bit of a barrier. So you want them to really open up, so get them to open their arms and open their legs, rest their hands on their lap and put their feet flat on the floor. At the end of this paragraph, you'll notice the words, that's fine. Now this crops up often, as I'm sure you noticed. Its purpose is to let the subjects know that what they're doing is right, they're doing well. If used after a suggestion to go deeper, it often makes the subjects realize that I'm pleased with their progress and that they're doing well. And this results in them going even deeper than had it not been included. The next section is the breathing exercise. As I've already mentioned, I always include this at the early stages of my inductions, as deep breathing alone, even without suggestion, can greatly relax the body and relieve tension. The session after this, about eyes being stuck shut, is there to show the volunteers that you do, in fact, know what you're doing. They will believe at this point that you have some kind of control over them. It is, in fact, a very, very simple demonstration, which most people, especially those about to be hypnotized and up on stage, will comply with. However, don't let them try to open their eyes for too long. This section is riddled with clever language that makes the feat of actually opening the eyes almost impossible if they're following your instructions. You will notice excessive use of the word try. Try implies failure. So if the subject is asked to try to open their eyes, they'll subconsciously have been told that they will fail. We also include the word attempt, and this increases the possibility of failure. So now the subject is instructed to attempt to try something. Both words imply failure, so this is a very, very effective and powerful command. Use of the word unstick, rather than using the word open, which would make just as much sense, allows you to include the embedded command to stick your eyes. Telling the subject to repeat the sentence, my eyes are tightly glued shut, is going to practically guarantee that every subject's eyes will remain closed, as they really first have to think subconsciously, I can open my eyes, before they're able to do it. Now making them repeat, my eyes are tightly glued shut, will not allow the thought that they can open them to enter their mind. Now if anybody does manage to open their eyes, you can simply send them back to their seat and let them know that they can still be hypnotized, but the style of induction that you're going to use today is not going to be suitable for them. Some people are more responsive to waking suggestions than others. And you will find that the people who did manage to open their eyes were not really following your instructions and did not concentrate on the task. Now, throughout this entire section, you want to speak quite fast and use an authoritative tone and use commands rather than asking people. The next section is the beginning of the actual induction process. As you say the words slow everything right down, lower your tone of voice and use this point to reduce the speed at which you are speaking. At regular intervals, whilst reading this section, slow down the speed at which you're speaking and keep dropping your tone of voice. By the time you reach the next section, you should be speaking in a soft, low and quiet voice. The reason you do this is because the subject creates an association between your voice and their state of relaxation. And as you begin to slow things down, 
they just become more relaxed. When you get to the stomach, you will notice that I again asked the subjects to listen only to the sound of my voice. And I also stated that there are no embarrassments between us. The reason behind this is that when the stomach relaxes, the digestive system begins to operate and the subject's stomach is probably going to begin to rumble. You can listen out for this as it's a really, really good indicator that the subject is relaxing deeply. However, don't incorporate this into a biofeedback loop the way that you would if somebody banged their glass into the bar, as this will only embarrass the subject. Of course, the subject hears their stomach, but rather than wondering why you haven't mentioned it, they will be hoping that you didn't really notice it. At this stage, the subjects are already in a very light trance. The next step in the induction process is to deepen that trance state. You can do this in many, many ways. A very clever way is to overload the subject's mind with a particular thought pattern. In this case, we use the color rushing back up through the body. This section should be read with an ever increasing volume, speed and tone in your voice. You're gonna need to sound excited as you race through the text and that color races up through their body. As you mention each part of the body, be sure to look out for muscle twitches in this area, as this will serve as an indicator of the kind of response you're getting from the subjects. The more twitches, the more involved. The more involved, the deeper in trance they are. Build this up so that the colour reaches their face, it's like a verbal explosion of excitement. This is very, very involving. It's exciting and it's a very powerful deepening procedure, and it prepares the subject for the more tranquil deepening process that follows. If you relax your body, you can feel some change. However, if you first tense every muscle in your body as hard as you can, and then you relax, the difference is unbelievable. Just try it. This is the same principle in action, but rather than working on the body, this time it's working on the mind. What follows is the final deepening process. In this particular case, I used walking downstairs, and this is probably used to deepen the trance state more than any other. Its basic content is the thought or action of descending. In this case, obviously, we used a flight of stairs, but you can use anything that you want. You might like to use a lift, an escalator, some ladders. These are all great examples. The basic idea is to link the image of physically going down with the thought of mentally going deeper into trance. This is a very effective way of substantially deepening the trance state. The image is enhanced in the subject's mind by asking them to notice things about their environment, like the temperature or the colour. This makes the whole situation seem more and more real for the subject, and as they become more and more absorbed in what it is they're thinking about, and less aware of their actual surroundings, they slip deeper and deeper into trance. This section must be spoken as slowly as possible, dragging out the words and using relaxing soft tones. The last section of the induction is also the first part of the routine. It's simply there to check the different depths of trance that all the different people are in. And also, of course, it deepens the trance state just that little bit more. Now that you know the breakdown of the induction script, you need to practice using it as often as possible. The basic layout of the induction is very, very simple, and as long as you stick to this basic layout, you should be able to change the script content as you wish and devise your own method of induction. The progressive relaxation induction process is one of the most reliable ways that you will learn to induce trance. However, as you gain credibility as a hypnotist, you will find that you will begin to use more impressive instant methods of induction more and more often. How to administer instant hypnosis. Now, as we've already discussed, hypnosis can be brought about in many ways. The progressive relaxation induction makes use of the increased suggestibility of a relaxing subject. The more instant methods of induction make use of different techniques, such as shock, confusion, or interruption. We're gonna go into these in a moment, but first, a word of warning. The success of the instant induction is dependent on a number of things. Firstly, the suggestibility of the subject. Some subjects are what we call somnambulistic. This means that they are able to reach very, very deep levels of trance, usually very quickly. Secondly, is the subject's belief in your ability as a hypnotist. Now this is a very important thing to remember as you start practicing hypnosis. If a subject doubts your ability, they are not likely to go into trance. It's for this reason that your best advice to stick with the progressive relaxation inductions until you've managed to make a name for yourself and people actually know that you have the ability to hypnotize. 
An ideal way to overcome this, especially for a stage hypnotist, is by creating some hype for yourself. So in the next session, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to be looking at the best ways that you can create hype. Creating hype. In the early days, the hype build up before hypnotic show would begin to appear weeks and sometimes months before the show, with daunting posters built all over town showing the hypnotist glaring down with piercing eyes. The caption would usually challenge, dare you look into his eyes and not obey his command. This method of creating hype proved very, very successful in those early days, and as the show grew closer, excitement would build as people dared each other to be put under the hypnotist's spell. Then, on the night of the show, everybody would be seated in the theatre. The lights would go down. A mixture of fear and excitement would engulf the entire audience. Suddenly, in an eerie silence, a single spotlight would appear at the edge of the stage. The hypnotist would stride to the centre of the stage and turn to the audience. With arms outstretched, the hypnotist would sweep the entire theatre, electrifying the onlookers with his power. The hypnotist would stand on the stage, dominating the whole audience with his intimidating gaze. He would stand tall and dress from head to toe in mysterious black. His menacing face would come to a point at his chin with his goatee style beard that echoed that of the devil. His hair slicked back, ready for business, allowed full access to those piercing eyes. As he passed his hands back over the audience, an explosive whisper could be heard throughout the entire theatre. He's doing something to me. He's doing something to me. This would be the cry of the vulnerable. And as the hypnotist preyed on his reluctant but brave victims, the fear of what was about to be was nearly enough in itself to produce the trance state in even the least suggestible of people. Now, this method of creating hype worked wonders for the hypnotist of its time. However, such a demonstration would be useless today. People are beginning to accept that hypnosis is a natural phenomenon. Probably due to television coverage, people are becoming more knowledgeable about the whole subject. This is not a problem for the hypnotist, as the fact that hypnosis is commonly used in the medical profession gives the whole subject more credibility. So the need for hype is not so important. This, however, is not the case when we're dealing with instant hypnosis. Instant hypnosis does depend, to a certain degree, on the use of hype. You can begin to create hype as you sell tickets for your shows. People are fascinated by the subject of hypnosis and always want to know what the secret to hypnotising somebody is. You can play on this curiosity by suggesting that it is a secret power that you are not permitted to expose. Suggest that the subject volunteers to be put under your spell so they can experience this power at work firsthand. The few moments that you have before a stage show also help create more hype. Stand on the stage looking out over your audience for a few seconds without saying anything. Glare out over the audience and make eye contact with as many people as you can. Take in a deep breath and with a sweep of your arms begin your introduction. You are all about to witness the phenomena that we call hypnosis. Some of you, and make eye contact to this point with individuals as you sweep the crowd again, are about to experience it. You can now continue to ask for your volunteers, and as they come up on stage, thank them for volunteering and commence with the pre-hypnotic talk and tests. The instant induction. The so-called instant induction is not actually as instant as it might appear. The hypnotist will first give indirect suggestion that the subjects go into trance with the use of subliminal messages and embedded commands. Now this is very, very simple. Go back to the beginning of the progressive relaxation induction script and just have a little read through the introduction. Now although to the volunteers this obviously seems very innocent, it's actually full of suggestions and it's by using such an introduction that you can line your volunteers up for an instant induction. Make sure that you take a good look at your volunteers as they come up on stage, as it's at this point that you'll need to decide which of your volunteers will be more likely to respond to the instant induction method of inducing trance. Once you've picked a couple of likely candidates, you can then proceed with the induction. The reason that you try to pick out the best subjects first is that once the rest of the volunteers have seen one person go under, they are much more likely to respond to hypnosis themselves. And of course, this works just the same in reverse. If your first subject doesn't go under, then on seeing this, the rest of your volunteers will have doubt in your ability, and as a result, they're less likely to go under too. Now, I hope this will illustrate that it is best for you to learn your craft thoroughly before risking losing your credibility as a hypnotist, and inevitably all your bookings. Once you become more experienced, you will be able to pick out who is the most likely person to respond to an instant induction method simply by looking out over your audience and noticing those that are already in trance. Having picked out your likely candidates, 
you can seemingly induce trance instantly by following the steps in the following session. Induction by interruption. Now this induction is often called the handshake interruption induction simply because you're going to interrupt a handshake. Now a handshake is just one movement, people know how to do it and when you interrupt it, it puts them in a very unusual situation, they don't really know what to do. Your induction gives them a way out of that. So as your chosen subject comes onto the stage, just reach out as though you're going to shake their hand with your right hand. And as they reach out for yours, use your left hand to grab their wrist and then lift their hand up in front of their face and command that they concentrate on their hand. As they do, describe what they can see and then say, go into trance only as quickly as your arm begins to drift down to your side. At this, they will begin to lower their arm and as they do, because they are staring at their hand, their eyes will naturally begin to close. As their arm continues to drift down, suggest to them, as your hand touches your leg, you will instantly go into a deep, deep trance, deeper and deeper to sleep. As soon as you have done this, tell them to only pay attention to the sound of your voice and continue straight away with a deepening script, such as the one that we used in the progressive relaxation method. Induction by shock. Again, as the first method, reach out as though you're going to shake the subject's hand, but put your left hand on their shoulder, and as you grasp their hand to shake it, rather than lifting it up in front of their face, simply jerk their arms sharply forwards. Obviously you don't want to be too aggressive with this one. Now this is going to cause them to lunge forwards, and as they do, put your left hand on the back of their head and begin to roll it from side to side. This will completely disorientate the subject and open them to accept your suggestions that they are getting more and more sleepy. Then you just continue as before with a deepening process. Induction by fallback test. Now this method above all others looks great on stage and follows from the suggestibility test very very well. You stand behind the subject and you tell them that they are about to feel an irresistible magnetic force pulling them back towards you. Tell them that you will not allow them to fall as you're right behind them and as they begin to topple backwards you will catch them. If anybody seems to be resisting your suggestions, add that the more they try to resist, the stronger the force will become. As they begin to fall backwards, put your hand on their forehead, tilt their head backwards and command sleep. And as you tilt their head onto your shoulder, then lower them down to the floor. Now you've got to be prepared to support their weight all the way down. It's actually much easier to do than it sounds, but don't do it on anybody that's too big or too heavy. Now by using this fallback technique with a number of people on a large stage, you're able to work very, very quickly along the whole line of subjects, dropping them like flies to the floor. Now this kind of demonstration looks amazing. However, what I will say is you want to tell people you're only talking to them if you happen to tap them on the shoulder. If you say, while people are very suggestible and up on stage, that they can feel a magnetic force putting them backwards on their shoulders and it's going to cause them to fall, and all of the people are responding to this, then some of your subjects might fall over while you're not standing behind them. So touch each one in turn on the back to let them know that those suggestions apply to them at this stage. So how does the instant induction work? The instant induction method of inducing trance is probably one of the most mysterious and admired induction methods available. It is very different from the progressive relaxation method as it makes use of the natural trance triggers and can instantly hand over control to the subconscious mind. In the early days of instant hypnosis, it was recognized that shock, fear and stress combined with confusion were an excellent recipe to access the subconscious. These discoveries led to an American stage hypnotist coming up with the most extreme methods of induction. He would call out the most sheepish looking volunteer from his subjects and then bombard them with deliberate threatening commands to sleep. What do you mean? What do you mean? I say sleep. I tell you sleep. Sleep. What do you mean? Now this bizarre and extraordinary question asked in such a forceful manner often resulted in the subject instantly flipping straight into a trance. Quite a few other hypnotists copied this style and very often they'd use two hypnotists at a time bombarding one subject with one hypnotist in each ear with similar suggestions until they got so confused they just flunked out into trance. Now I'm not suggesting that you use these kind of tactics. If you did, then I doubt you'd probably get anyone to volunteer for you again. The methods that we've discussed will be more than adequate in inducing trance in your subjects instantly. 
Both of the handshaking techniques, pulling the hand up in front of the face and jerking the arm forward, use the same principle to aid the induction process. This is the method of interruption. Everybody knows how to shake hands. It's a single process for them. They reach up, shake and let go, all in one action. However, when that action is interrupted, the subject is at a loss as to where they should go next. So, as they stand there in a state of confusion, you come to the rescue by suggesting a direction for them to follow, which in this case is into trance. The hand raising method then makes use of fixation of attention to guide the subject towards trance, whereas the arm jerk method will make more direct use of shock and confusion. You should use the arm jerk method on people that you think may be a little bit more difficult to put under and save the hand raise method for those that you think may object to having their arm jerked down. The fallback method makes use of confusion as a means to acquire the hypnotic state. It is at the point where you tip the head back that the confusion is greatest and you make good use of this by delivering your order to sleep just as the subject is at their most vulnerable point. If you're going to develop as a stage hypnotist, then no doubt the format method will become the method that you're going to use most often. One of the great advantages of using the fallback method is that if the subject doesn't respond the way you'd like, you can just pass this off as a pre-hypnotic test, just like those we discussed earlier, and continue with a more conventional progressive relaxation method. The fallback induction is also one of the most aesthetically pleasing methods to witness from the point of view of the audience. Waking the subject from hypnosis. Getting stuck in trance is one of the things that most volunteers fear more than anything else. It's for this reason that you really need to put the volunteer's mind at ease by telling them how simple it is to wake up from hypnosis. You will have noticed that I went into the waking procedure a little at the beginning of the hypnotic induction script. Everything that I said at that point was true, however, I didn't mention the very rare possibility of the subject actually staying in hypnosis after you've given them the instruction to wake. Every so often, you will come across a subject who will refuse to wake up. The reason behind this is that the person's life might be very dull, and they will enjoy the trance state so much that they're going to want to stay there. It's like going to sleep and having a wonderful dream, and not wanting to wake from that experience. If you find yourself faced with such a subject, all you need to do is to gradually bring them round in the same kind of fashion as you would gradually put them under. You can do this in several ways. If you are particularly good at gaining rapport and pacing and leading a subject, you can use this method to simply gain rapport and then slowly get the subject to follow you out of trance. Another and a lot simpler method is to tell subjects that you are going to count up from 1 to 10 and when you reach 10 they will be wide awake. Then proceed to start counting and as you do, interlace the numbers with suggestions of becoming more and more alert. Using this method, you will often find that the subject is awake and back to their normal state before you can get as far as the number five. If you're still having problems, then you can use shock tactics. Simply turn to another volunteer and request that they go and fetch you a bucket of water as you're having problems getting one of the volunteers to wake up. Now, of course, the hypnotized subject is gonna hear this request and will instantly wake up to avoid a soaking. When you wake your volunteers, except in the case just mentioned, never use shock. Always make sure that you're waking your volunteers gradually and in a good mood. To do this, simply use some positive affirmations during the wake up script. An affirmation can be as simple as telling the subject that when they wake up, they will look and feel better than they've ever felt in their entire lives. You do need to be careful with your language because a hypnotized subject's mind is very, very literal. And I'm sure you can imagine the difference between metaphorically feeling like a million dollars and actually believing you do feel and look like a million dollars that's been crumpled up in people's pockets. When you're putting your affirmations together, you must always speak in a positive context and in the present tense. What you are basically trying to do with the affirmations is make the subject feel wonderful when they wake up. And you can achieve this in many ways. If you like, tell the subject that they've just had a relaxing, refreshing five hours sleep, and upon awakening, they will feel refreshed, relaxed, and alert. If you prefer, then tell them they are beautiful or amazing, or whatever you desire. As long as you remember to keep the affirmation positive and in the present tense, you really, really can't go wrong. The different trance phenomena. Once your subjects are in the hypnotic state, you can perform almost any routine you desire. The options are as limited as just your imagination. 
There are six different trance phenomena that you need to be aware of. This will help you to plan your routines to ensure a greater variety. The phenomena are all listed below for you with a brief explanation of how you might use each. First up, we've got regression. Now to regress somebody is to remember or relive a past experience. Regression is often used on the stage and usually in the form of a subject being regressed to childhood or being naughty at school, perhaps an early birthday. Regression is not limited to your lifetime and people are often regressed during hypnotherapy to cure psychosomatic illnesses. Progression. This is the opposite of regression. People are progressed in therapy to help them see how their life will turn out and if necessary, make changes to make their future a better one. On the stage, progression could be used for such routines as a 100th birthday party. Post-hypnotic suggestion. Post-hypnotic suggestion is essential for stage hypnosis. It is exactly as its name suggests, a hypnotic suggestion that is to be carried out after the termination of the trance state. It is used in almost every routine you'll come across, and more importantly, it is used to keep your subject in a trance. An example of a post-hypnotic suggestion that you're going to use more than any other is this. When I click my fingers and say the word sleep, you will instantly go back into a deep, deep state of hypnosis. Post-hypnotic suggestions are also widely used in the field of hypnotherapy. Suggestions such as, from this moment forward, whenever somebody offers you a cigarette, you will instantly reply, no thank you, I'm a non-smoker. It's worth noticing at this point that a post-hypnotic suggestion will stay inside somebody's mind forever. So let's say for example that you're performing a show and you tell a subject that when they hear a certain piece of music they will instantly jump to their feet and start dancing in front of the audience. Now unless you later delete that suggestion, whenever that person hears that piece of music playing they're going to get this overwhelming urge to jump to their feet and start dancing. Now perhaps this isn't the best thing for them to do, especially if they've got to drive home. So it's a good idea to prefix any post-hypnotic suggestions with the sentence for the rest of the show, or for the rest of the evening, or for the next few minutes. And then at the end of the show, make sure you return everybody to their normal waking state. Amnesia. Amnesia is simply forgetting. Most people suffer from spontaneous amnesia upon waking from the hypnotic state. You will see this at the end of your show when your volunteers leave the stage and run straight to their friends to ask what they've been doing. You can use amnesia in a routine by making someone forget a number and then for example try to count their fingers. Not everyone does forget everything, some people remember everything you've said, so it's a little bit like having a dream. Sometimes we forget them, sometimes we remember them and sometimes we can only remember fragments until we're reminded of them later. Positive hallucination. Now this is simply seeing, hearing or feeling something that is not there. This can be very amusing on the stage. If for example you were to tell a subject that their hair is growing at the rate of 10 centimeters a second and under no circumstances are they allowed to let it touch the floor. I'm sure you can imagine the pantomime as the subject tries to hold armfuls of sprouting hair desperately trying to keep it off the floor. Negative hallucination. This is the opposite of the positive hallucination, and it's a godsend to the stage hypnotist. Imagine the look on the subject's face as things start to float around the stage, seemingly on their own, but with the help of an invisible hypnotist. Or of course, the absolute classic, getting the subject to negatively hallucinate everybody's clothes in the audience so they think they can see everybody naked. Putting on your very first show. You should by now be able to induce the trance state in a subject. The next step is to learn what to do once the subject is hypnotized and once you've deepened the trance state. A successful hypnotic show must be considered in the same manner that a choreographer would consider the steps of a new dance routine. It's no good to simply induce trance and then begin some routine off the top of your head. You must pre-plan the whole show bearing the following points in mind. Firstly, think about the way the show is going to look from the audience's point of view. Remember that the whole purpose of the show is to entertain the audience, so you will want to make it interesting and exciting. Don't drag the show out for too long or the audience is going to lose interest. It is much better to leave them wanting more as this will inevitably lead to more bookings. You should also always plan your show so the first routine grabs the attention of the audience, make it something bizarre and funny, and then proceed to demonstrate the various different trance phenomena, always keeping the visual entertainment value as great as possible. End the show with a dramatic grand finale. Don't let it slip away, otherwise your audience becomes distracted. 
The second thing you should consider is the depth of trance that the volunteers are likely to be in. Avoid the more demanding routines at the beginning of your show and try to stick to those routines that actually deepen the trance state. Now I've included a selection of routines that you can use later. To help you put your shows together, these routines have been categorised into different sections as to whether they are to be used to deepen the trance, on waking the subject, as a post-hypnotic suggestion, on a single subject or on the whole group. The appendix at the end of the book will help you to structure out the content of your show, but how do you put it all together? Right now we're going to look at the different ingredients that you need to make sure your show is successful. First up, your equipment. The first thing you need to consider is your equipment. Basically, has the venue where you're going to perform your show got the necessary equipment? Basically, you will need a microphone, an amplifier and speakers. And for certain routines, you're going to need to be playing music. You will find that most venues are equipped to cope with your performance, but it's always best to check beforehand. If a venue doesn't have its own equipment, find out if there's a DJ on the night of your show. If there is, you might be able to use theirs. It's also worth investing in a good quality microphone, as most pub and club microphones are substandard. And if you're going to be serious about doing stage hypnosis, you probably want to get yourself a radio microphone so you don't have to deal with the lead, and also some kind of microphone holder that you can clip to yourself so that you can have your hands free for the kind of inductions where you're going to be needing them, like the fallback test. Secondly, you must consider your appearance. You must be of a presentable appearance. Make sure that your hair is well groomed and decide on what you're going to wear for your show and try to stick to the same outfit. You may like to try to make your outfit a little bit different so you stand out from your volunteers. Thirdly, the setting of the stage. Before the show, ask the owner or manager for about 15 to 20 chairs depending on the side of the stage and then arrange these in a semicircle facing the audience. As mentioned earlier, you want the chairs to be touching each other. Now this is going to be too close but enables you to give the command to your subjects when they come up on stage to move the chairs apart which preconditions them into accepting your commands. Fourth is the introduction. If the venue where you're working doesn't have a compare, you will need someone to introduce you. If you can't persuade a friend to do this, consider recording an introduction of yourself that can be played over the venue's music system. Make it dramatic and use some music to really build you up. Next we need to consider your entrance. If you intend using instant hypnosis, then you're advised to make your entrance as dramatic as possible. If you're sticking with progressive relaxation, then this is really not so important. Greet the crowd and tell them who you are and what you're going to do. Next, you need to ask for your volunteers. Now you shouldn't really pick on anybody when you do this. Quite a few hypnotists get everybody to do the pre-hypnotic suggestibility test and then they pick the people that respond well to the test even though they don't really want to come up on stage. So it's a much better idea to ask the people who do want to volunteer to come up on stage and then do your suggestibility tests on those. It should be completely their decision. Of course you can persuade them with the use of subliminal messages and embedded commands in your entrance speech. Next we've got your pre-hypnotic talk. Once the volunteers are all seated, proceed to explain a little bit about what they can expect. This is going to help them to relax and it's also going to enable you to get rid of any misconceptions that they might have about trance. You will have noticed during the induction script earlier that it's also a very very easy way to bombard your subject with embedded commands that they'll go into trance quickly before the induction even begins. Next up we've got the suggestibility test themselves. Now, you should conduct the suggestibility tests on all of your volunteers to help you decide which you're going to keep for your show and which you're going to send back to their seats, but also to help you decide which ones are the most exhibitionist and the ones that you're going to use for different routines. If somebody really overreacts, then you might want to bear that person in mind when you're going to do the x-ray specs routine and they can see the audience naked. Next up, of course, we've got the actual induction process itself. This is where you've got to put people into hypnosis, and this is usually a very nerve-wracking experience for the beginner, especially the first time. But don't worry, because if you followed all of the steps correctly, you will have no problem putting your volunteers into trance. Whether you use the progressive relaxation method or one of the instant inductions really doesn't matter, that's up to you. Usually when you're on stage and people are coming up on stage to be hypnotized, they expect to go into trance so much that it is really, really easy to do. In fact, it's much, much easier to do this in a venue where you've got an audience and you're up on stage than it is to just hypnotize one of your friends at home. So next up, we're gonna deepen the trance state. You must now deepen the trance by using the deepening procedure that is detailed in the trance induction script earlier. 
A very easy and useful method of deepening the trance further is to tell your subject that when you tap them on the forehead, they will instantly go twice as deep into trance. Then what you should do is proceed to tap each volunteer twice on the forehead in quick succession and command sleep with each tap. The reason you do it twice is because the first tap is expected, but the second one really creates a sense of confusion and shock and it really does push you that little bit deeper. Now I've been on both sides of a stage hypnotic performance and one of the things I've noticed about doing this particular little trick is that when a hypnotist is using a microphone and their voice is coming out of a speaker that's over the other side of the room, the little tap on your forehead is very surprising because you don't think the hypnotist is standing next to you. You think it's at the other end of the line still tapping the foreheads of the other volunteers. So when this happens it is a bit of a shock and then that command on the tap to sleep goes straight into your subconscious mind so it's a really crafty little way of deepening the trance state. Next up you need to consider your hypnotic routines. Now this is the main part of your show so think about it carefully and consider the points that we've discussed at the beginning of this section. The actual performance should last around about half an hour depending on the crowd and the volunteers. You should make sure that you get into the habit of performing your show to the audience not to your volunteers so try not to spend too much time with your back to the audience unless it's completely necessary and as much as is possible try not to block anybody's view of what's going on. The next step is to wake up your volunteers. So at the end of the show, you should wake your volunteers and return them to their normal waking self. You need to make sure that you remove all of the suggestions you've put in, as we've already discussed, but of course you can leave some positive affirmations in there. You should never really make any substantial changes to the subject, even if they ask you to. A prime example might be giving up smoking or help them to lose weight. If they've asked you to do anything like that on a stage show, just say that you'll sort that out during a hypnotherapy session and then give them a business card and set up a session to see them for this if you're qualified to do it. If not, then you can recommend a CD program from another hypnotist or indeed one of your own if you sell them. Once you've done that, remember to thank your volunteers. At the end of each show, make sure you thank your volunteers and get the audience to give them a big round of applause, acknowledging them as the true stars of the show. This is also a great opportunity to ask a few of the volunteers what they thought about the hypnotic experience. The responses you get are always positive and they're going to help you to make more volunteers the next time you ask to perform at the same show. After that, you can hand control back to the DJ if there is one and leave the stage. You should always stay in the venue for around about an hour after the performance, just in case anybody's got any questions or any problems. There's never really any problems, but it's better to be safe than sorry. And of course, people are going to be asking you questions about hypnosis, such as, do you also do hypnotherapy? I'd like to lose weight. So it's a great way to get a little bit of extra business for yourself. And of course, there may be some people that have got their own birthdays coming up that might be interested in booking you. So make sure you take some business cards and stick around just in case anybody wants to use your services in future. The volunteers. Although you've not really got a great deal of say in who does volunteer for your show and who does not, you do have the last word in deciding who you're going to keep and who you're going to send back to their seats. The obvious decision is to discard all of the people that don't respond very well. But before you do this, you need to consider who you're going to be left with. So have a little look through this list below and it will help you decide who's going to be best and which people you really want to keep. Different sexes. It's best to keep a good selection of different sexes as some routines are better for one sex than the other. Children. If a child volunteers, just send them back straight away. You should never ever hypnotize anybody under the age of 18. You should make this clear at the start of your show before you even call for your volunteers. Attractive people. Attractive people are nice to look at. They're going to keep the audience's interest. So I hate to say it, but if someone's a little bit ugly and someone's more attractive and they're roughly the same level of suggestibility, keep the attractive one. Pregnant women. Although hypnosis would not harm a pregnant woman, if there were complications with the birth, people might start to point the finger in your direction. And this is something you really, really could do without. So avoid the possibility by not hypnotizing anybody who is pregnant in the first place. People who suffer from epilepsy. Do not hypnotize anybody who suffers from epilepsy and make it clear before you call for your volunteers that you cannot hypnotize epileptic people and they are not to volunteer for the show. People who are schizophrenic or suffer from mental illness. Again, as with epilepsy sufferers, do not hypnotize anybody who is a schizophrenic. Make it clear at the beginning of your show that you're not able to hypnotize anybody who suffers from a mental condition and they shouldn't volunteer. 
Now I hope this list will be of some use to you when you're picking out your subjects. It's also worth bearing in mind what you get your subjects to do. Remember that the subject's friends are in the audience. Now I'm sure you can imagine the reaction you would get from a rather large boyfriend after the whole pub has witnessed his girlfriend performing a strip tease routine on the stage. It's for reasons like this that you must carefully consider every routine of your show. One last point to bear in mind is the way that people perceive stage hypnosis. It's due to the actions of the few thoughtless individuals that the name of stage hypnosis has been recently tarnished. I make a point of keeping all of my routines in good humour. I never get anybody to strip and I never embarrass or humiliate any of my volunteers. I also try to use routines where the audience are laughing with the volunteers rather than at them. If all stage hypnotists did this, then the craft would be more widely accepted and appreciated as a proper form of entertainment. This is the direction that I really hope hypnosis goes, and I hope that you follow the advice I've given you in this book and aim for the same. Getting work as a stage hypnotist. Now it's not going to be long before you're ready to put on your very first show. This is often a very nerve wracking experience for the beginner, but it needn't be if you go about it in the correct way. You should learn your craft thoroughly by practicing on friends. This will prepare you for your next step towards stardom. Make sure you get invited to as many parties as possible, talk about hypnosis and offer to put on a hypnotic show for the guests. People are interested in hypnosis so they will usually say yes. This will help you to get used to performing in front of an audience and because of the informality and the fact that you're not getting paid, it's not going to really matter if you make a few mistakes. The next step is the real big one. You need to actually perform to the paying public on a stage in a public place. Your first paying show could be performed at a works party or perhaps your local pub or club. If you've already practiced, many of the people that are going to be there will be your friends and you've probably hypnotized some of them before. This will help combat your nerves for the first real performance. Also don't worry about stage fright. I never would have been able to get up on stage in front of a crowd before I actually learned about hypnosis. But when the time for your first show comes about, you'll probably find that, like I was, you'll be far too worried about the actual content of your show looking good for the audience to even think about stage fright. And after your first show, I've got to tell you, you will not be able to wait for your second. It gives you such a buzz when people start to recognise you and you can see the effect that you're having on the audience. The next logical step is to go on to bigger and better things, and usually bigger and better pay. So you might want to try out the nightclub scene, and after that you might want to take it to the theatre. Great profits can be made if you consider the possibility of television. If you want to venture into this side of things, then you're well advised to get yourself an agent. Another tip that will help you to get onto the box is to approach a local cable channel to see if you can do a show for them. You probably won't get paid much for it, but it will look excellent in your CV and the experience you will acquire and the contacts you meet will prove invaluable. Make sure that potential venues know you're available. Remember, they're not gonna to come to you, you need to go to them phone venues and speak to the manager about the possibility of you performing at their establishment. If they need to consult with a partner, then arrange a time and a day for you to phone them back for their decision rather than leaving your number as it's all too easy for them to forget about you. Conclusion. If you apply the instructions that I've given you through this book, with a little bit of practice, you will very shortly be earning a substantial income from stage hypnosis. Of course, if you want to go into hypnotherapy as well, then that's a fantastic sideline for you. You can sell your CDs at the venues where you perform. Now, I've told you all I can at this stage. Now it's up to you. I can't make you go out and practice hypnosis, but that's what I urge you to do. And of course, remember, it's only through the safe and proper use of hypnosis on the stage that we're going to be able to clear the name of the stage hypnotist and gain acceptance in both the field of entertainment and through its help, the medical profession. Remember that as long as you practice, you must have respect for those that make your show and ultimately your money, your volunteer. Now before we close, I just want to give you a few ideas of some hypnotic routines that you might like to try out. Hypnotic routines can be broken into a couple of categories. First of all, we're going to be looking at trance deepening routines that you can use on the entire group. Now you'll use these near the beginning of your show. You use them on everybody and they serve two purposes. First up, they do deepen the trance state and it's not too embarrassing for people that are only in very, very light hypnosis because you're not singling anybody out. And secondly, you'll be able to see how people respond to these routines so that you can pick the people for single routines later on in your show more effectively.
So to kick off, we've got bikers. So have all of your subjects seated and tell them that they're all Hell's Angels bikers astride their new Harleys. Get them to rev their bikes and pull horrible faces at the other bikers and then make them all race. But be sure to tell them they've got to make the sound of their bike with their mouths as they do. A similar routine is the horse race. Here you tell everyone they're at the Grand National on a famous race horse. Make them put their helmets on, grab their reins because they're under starter's orders and they're off. You can commentate the race and tell them when they're coming to each jump. And the people really do jump up in their chairs. And then make sure they understand they're on the final battle of the final straight and everybody's a winner. Next up is a routine that I've already mentioned. This is the freezing cold routine. Now when you're doing hypnosis just on a single person, this routine is fantastic because when you see those goosebumps, it's proper confirmation that they really are in trance. But when you've got a group of people, it becomes hilarious because you can tell them that they need to huggle together to keep warmer and warmer. So you've got perfect strangers hugging each other, trying to keep warm and keep the cold at bay. Next up, we've got the funniest thing routine. Here, you tell the subjects that when you count to three, they're gonna see the funniest thing they've ever seen and they're gonna be rolling around with laughter and the more bizarre, the funnier it'll get. Tell them that they're gonna feel the laughter coming to them as soon as you begin to count, but they're not allowed to laugh until you reach the number three and then count really, really slowly. So go one, two, two and a quarter, two and a half, two and three quarters and tease them all the way up to three. Now this routine can be used as a crossover between the routines where everybody's joining in with their eyes closed and routines with their eyes open. So one of the things I regularly did when doing stage shows in the early days so I'd use this funniest thing routine to tell all of my volunteers that on the count of three, they'd open their eyes, look out into the audience, and the audience would be bizarre and ridiculous, which I thought was fair because throughout a hypnotic show, usually the audience are laughing at the volunteers. So this was turning the tables a little and letting the volunteers have a bit of a laugh at the audience. And then of course you can go around and ask the people what they can see. Now sometimes what you get back from that, hit, it's amazing. It just gives you an insight into people's imagination and it enables you to cross over from having your subjects eyes closed on routines such as the horse race and freezing cold and that kind of thing to beginning routines where they have to open their eyes. Once you've done this you can then follow it up by clicking your fingers, saying sleep and telling everyone they're going back into a trance but of course you need to have installed that already. So that's a post-hypnotic suggestion that you're going to put in there right at the beginning. And to do that, you simply say from this moment forward, for the rest of the evening, whenever I click my fingers and say the word sleep, you will instantly return to a deep, deep, deep slate of hypnosis. And once that suggestion is in, you can then do post-hypnotic suggestions that we're going to go to in a moment. And once they've done the routine, just put them straight back into a trance. So you don't have to go through the entire hypnosis process again. So post-hypnotic suggestions. There's a few classics that you can try out and of course you can make up your own. Perhaps the most famous is the X-ray vision or the, um, the naked glasses. With this one, you tell a subject that when they're awaken, they're gonna try on a very special pair of glasses that you'll give them. And when they try them on, they're gonna see all the members of the audience completely naked. Then wake the volunteer, have a little bit of dialogue telling them that you've been experimenting with a pair of glasses that you'd like them to try out and then let them put the glasses on and watch their face. The results are amazing. Now with this one, quite often it's very amusing to sell the glasses to the volunteer and some people are willing to pay quite a lot of money for some x-ray specs. But do make sure at the end of the show that you do give them their money back. One of the things that I used to like to do is to tell them that they were the star of the show and they've won the star of the show prize. And maybe they might want to go and buy their friends a drink with that. Now, to make this routine more amusing, because you really need to have to perform these to the audience rather than to the volunteers, you want to get a prop of a really great big pair of comedy glasses. So that's going to really spice that one up. Next up, we've got a couple of routines that go very, very well together, but you might want to be careful about who you use these routines on. First up, we've got the face cream and then the flower wash. Now the face cream, you tell your subject that when they wake up, they'll believe they're making a TV commercial and they're demonstrating a wonderful, fantastic new face cream. Wake the subject up and hand them a pot of jam. Then step back and watch the fun as your subject happily smears the jam all over their face as they advertise it to your audience. You can follow this one fantastically with the flower wash. 
This is where you tell the subject that they suddenly realize what they've done, they realize they've got jam all over their face, and you tell them that there's a bowl of water in front of them and they can use it to wash off the jam. And then you hand them a bowl of flour. They will then quite happily proceed to try and wash the jam off their faces with the flour, and I'm sure you can imagine the results. Once you've done a few post-hypnotic suggestions, you'll be wanting to close your show with a grand finale. And a couple of great ones that you can use is a band, which you can use, say, a big brass band and have everybody playing a different instrument or a rock band, or perhaps get them to dance a certain routine. Uh, you could have all of your volunteers dancing the hula or even the YMCA by the village people. Something that incorporates everybody and goes out on a high with everyone being happy is a fantastic close to the show. So I hope this section has helped put your brain into overdrive and you're already coming up with countless routines that you can perform to the public. All it leaves me to say now is good luck as you embark on a journey that is going to change your life. And of course, if you've got this uh, audio recording as part of the package, do listen to and read the Making Hypnosis Simple book because that's gonna take you up to the next level. There's a lot of language patterns in there that are gonna enable you to take what you've already learned and make it much more powerful. So I do hope that you experiment with all areas of hypnosis. I originally got into hypnosis for stage, and I then went on to hypnotherapy, past life regression, uh, I got into healing and more spiritual uses of hypnosis, and it's been a fascinating and incredibly rewarding and very profitable journey. So do explore all the other areas of trance too. I'd also like to recommend a course by Nathan Thomas, called The Confident Hypnotist, uh, which is available at Nathan's website at nathanthomashypnosis.com. So you take care, have a lot of fun, and use hypnosis responsibly. And remember to always bear in mind that your hypnotized subject might respond to your suggestion, though it's completely real. So keep your suggestions sensible and safe, and keep their safety, their well-being, and their dignity in mind whenever you get anybody to do anything, and have a lot of fun. Take care. Bye-bye.